फोर थ्री टू वन स्टार्ट गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वी वेलकम you all to ortho tv online in association with odisha orthopedic association uh, to introduce today's topic and speaker i hand over to the moderators yes so sir sir you can uh, start right away yeah uh, am i visible now yeah yes hello Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I take this privilege of uh, uh, welcoming you all to this advanced symposium on acetabular surgeries. I, Dr. Tushar Kanthi Panda, along with my colleague, Pro. Dr. Pranav, uh, will be moderating these sessions. So there are a uh, lot of eminent international and national faculties who will be delivering their talks and share their experiences. And uh, the talks will be followed by a case discussion at the end, at the end and which will be held by the panel members okay so in between the sessions in which the talks are going to be of 15 minutes each and in between the talks uh, if the time permits we can take up a few questions from the uh, delegates who are attending and try to have a proper discussion so this is going to be an exciting session we all look forward to and uh, probably without uh, Wasting much of time, I hand over uh, to, to invite uh, Professor Biswajit Sahu. He is the professor and head of the department of orthopedics uh, or SV Medical College. He will start the introduction and introduce all the faculty members. Yeah, over to you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Share your screen, sir. Yes. Yeah. Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this advanced astabular symposium. We have got a galaxy of faculties today for this advanced astabular symposium. let me introduce our star faculty first our star faculty today is professor dr paul romans is from the university medical center johannes gutenberg university mainz germany is from the department of orthopedics and traumatology is the director of the department of orthopedics and traumatology at the university medical center is a johannes gutenberg university mainz in germany he is there from 2013 till that is a chair person of the eo trauma europe research group the staff member of the department of traumatology and emergency surgery at the university hospital in leuven belgium the ordinary professor and chief of the department of traumatology at the university medical center in the johannes gutenberg university of mainz he is the founder and first president of the belgium trauma society dr paul romes is the president of the kuncher society from 1997 to 2003 as the president of the european society of trauma and emergency surgery the secretary general of the european society of trauma and emergency surgery from 2011 to 2017 as a member of the pelvic expert group of the ao technical commission as the editor of european journal of trauma and emergency surgery as the editor and author of eight monographs and monographs and books next our star faculty is dr v r k b prasad gorineni as the clinical associate professor from the university of illinois chicago us as the honorary consultant in our sri balaji institute of surgery research and rehabilitation for the disabled trust tirupati as the honorary consultant of nizams institute of medical science india and as the head division of pediatric orthopedics in advocate children's hospital oakland as the founder of the hip preservation society dr prasad is the fellow of american academy of orthopedic surgeons member of orthopedic trauma association pediatric orthopedics of india pediatric orthopedic society of north america is the associate editor of the journal of orthopedics elsewhere we are the faculty to many hip preservation courses as well as many national and international conferences next is our own professor ramesh kumar sain sir he is the currently working as senior director and head of the department institute of orthopedic surgery max hospital mohali 
He has got more than 28 years of experience in orthopedic surgery, including 20 years of faculty at PGI Chandigarh. He has been a visiting professor in German and US, in addition to having been invited as guest speaker in more than 25 countries. He is the recipient of the highest research award of SARC countries, as well as of Indian Orthopedic Association. He has been the chairperson of the Research Foundation, as well as the, is right now the president-elect of Indian Orthopedic Association. Dr. Ramesh Sen will be taking over as the president of prestigious Indian Orthopedic Association from coming December. He has pioneered the role of stem cell treatment in avian disease of the hip joint and also patented in his name for new pelvic plate for reconstruction of the ostabular fractures. Dr. Chitra Prasad Das is the son of our own Odisha soil. He worked in the reputed hospitals at CMC Hospital, Velour and Mio Chennai. He has got excellent exposure to innovative European joint replacement surgery at Stuttgart, Germany. In 1994, he had gone to Geneva, Switzerland to excel for the training. Thereafter, he spent four years of his career in England with Masters in World's famous centers at East Anglia and Manchester. He has established the most sophisticated unit for joint replacement surgery and astabulum surgery at West End Hospital in Katak in the year 2003. He was the past president of Association of Pelvi Astabular Surgeons of India, and he was the immediate past president of Odisha Orthopedic Association. Professor Dr. Vivek Tirka is a professor in JP Trauma Center of AMS New Delhi. He has got medical training and experience from AMS New Delhi with a faculty in various national and international courses, AO, CCOT, APO courses on orthopedic trauma. He was a CCOT trauma committee member. Oh, he has got more than 100 PubMed index publications as a member of Institute Research Committee. His special interests are in pelvic vestibular surgery, complex trauma and particular fractures, skeletal infection, trauma, basic research, and trauma education. Pradeep Nemadai is a young and dynamic astabular surgeon. He is an assistant professor from ortho, is a, in orthopedics from uh, said GSMC and KM Hospital, Mumbai. He is working then since August 2010. He is a recipient of gold medal orthopedic surgery in Padma Bhushan Dr. K. Sanchiti Award in 2009. He has got gold medal in orthopedic surgery Dr. Balu Sankaran Award in 2019. He is a diplomat of National Board in New Delhi. He was a co convener of the Pelvi Astabular course in August 2012, which was conducted by the Bombay Orthopedic Society. Dr. Pranav Sa is, is a senior consultant and director of the Department of Orthopedic Trauma, CIF Sims Hospital, Ahmedabad. We are the past president of Ahmedabad Orthopedic Society and was the secretary of the Associate of, Association of Pelvi Astabular Surgeons. His academic interests are DNB teaching, he was the OAO faculty and organized many PG lecture courses. Apart from that, we have got our faculty today, Dr. Satya Prasanna, who is a professor in Som Hospital, Bhubaneswar, and Dr. Kishore Ponda, who is the convener and organizing secretary of this course. Both are young astabular surgeons. With this, I welcome all the faculties to this advanced well, astabular symposium. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, so uh, there is a little bit uh, change in the program uh, as uh, Professor Roman uh, uh, have to leave early. So I request Professor Roman to start his lecture directly. So any question regarding his lecture can be taken after the after his lecture. Uh, okay, thank you, Professor Roman. Please. Can you see my lecture? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. It's very nice to see you back. Um, although it is a uh, video meeting, I'm very happy to be uh, one of the speakers of this very prestigious uh, orthopedic society meeting. And the talk of today uh, will be my talk of today is uh, on acetabular fracture fixation in the elderly. Question mark, is it different? In the last decades, we are confronted with a shift in the trauma pathologies due to a growing uh, expectancy of our people, mostly in the industrialized countries. Due to this very high life expectancy, we see an increase of typical geriatric fractures. Here you see a statistic from the United States from 1993 till 2010, where you see that acetabular fractures in number 
uh, growed from 3,500 to about 6,000 per year. And this is only in people above 65 years old. And if you look in the second graphic, you see that the percentage show the incidence of acetabular fractures relative to all geriatric fractures around the hip was increasing in this time between 1.4% and 2.6%. And so it's uh, still a not very common pathology, but it's clearly increasing in relation to other pathologies. If we look at the data from the German pelvic registry, here you see a registry uh, between 2002 and 2017, then you recognize that the um, steepest, um, uh, the, the highest number of uh, acetabular fractures in this registry was in people of 80 years old. So this is a very um, recent registry, and I, I think that reflects very well that what we see today. In uh, 10 years ago, uh, about um, Joel Mata from Los Angeles published this paper, and he looked back uh, at his operated acetabular fractures between 1980 and 2007. And in the conclusion or in the abstract of his paper, he said that the incidence of elderly patients with acetabular fractures increased by 2.4 between the first half of the study period and the second half. And fractures were characterized by displacement of the anterior column. They were much more common than pathologies of the posterior column. Here you see, one of the statistics of his paper, and you see anterior wall fractures, anterior column fractures, and anterior wall plus or column plus posterior hemitransfers significantly increased in incidence in this, uh, uh, in this uh, period of time. Here on the left side, you see people below the 60 years of age and uh, above 60 years of age in the second column. So there is a shift also, not only in the incidence, but also in the fracture types that we uh, are uh, confronted with in this uh, older people. The common radiological features of the fractures in this older people included a separate quadrilateral plate component in 50% of the cases, a roof impaction in 40%, a comminution of the acetabular uh, fractures in 44% uh, and a marginal impaction in 38%. And these uh, radiological features have been shown also in other studies to be predictive of a pure outcome. Here you see one of our patients. It's a typical older patient with a marginal impaction, look at the arrows, the white arrows, but also a defect uh, due to this sharp edge of the remaining um, acetabulum, a sharp uh, um, a damage to the femoral head that is very nicely visible if we have reduced the femoral head uh, to its anatomical place. And if you look then, this is a very serious damage that perhaps is a predictive for a total hip replacement after a certain time. Personally, we looked back at our um, patients that were operated uh, in our department um, in the last years. You see here, it were 70 patients, uh, all older than 65 years old, 47, 46 have been operated, 24 were treated conservatively. And we found negative predictive factors in the operated group in 54%. Uh, and if you, if you look at the um, incidence of anatomical reductions, it goes very well with the negative predictive factors. We were able to reach an anatomical reduction in only 59% of them. Uh, we had an observation period of about three years and uh, a conversion to a total hip atroplasty was needed 
in 24% of this operated group. But all of them, and that I think is very important, had an imperfect reduction after the primary surgery. There was no conversion to a total hip atroplasty in all the patients that had an anatomical reduction. And this is depending on this predictive factors as I have shown you before. The conclusion of this paper was that we have to analyze the preoperative radiographs, the conventional ones and the CTs for the presence of negative predictive factors like subchondral impaction, damage to the femoral head and fracture comminution. And that should be decisive for the type of treatment. If we have this combination of negative predictive factors together with the acetabular fracture, the ORIF cannot be regarded as a definitive solution because it is very unlikely that you will have, uh, you, you will uh, reach an anatomical reduction. So it is rather uh, a reconstruction of a stable socket for a secondary or even a primary total hip atroplasty in combination with the ORIF. You see a 72-year-old woman uh, with a fall uh, from a standing position. Uh, you recognize in AP and in all of you this anterior column and posterior hemi-transverse fracture with uh, a medial displacement of the quadrilateral surface. Here you can recognize that the bone density is relatively well preserved in this patient. So <laughs> we tried, uh, I go back, there are no negative predictive factors, you see no comminution, you see no marginal impaction, and you see no femoral head damage. So we go for a primary um, uh, open reduction and internal fixation, and this surgery is meant as a definitive treatment, not as a preparatory treatment for a total hip atroplasty. And this is the AP and obturator view. We could reach a nice reconstruction of this acetabulum. And uh, seven months postoperatively, the patient was doing well and had the same mobility and independency as before. Here, the obturator view together with the AP view. Another paper uh, was focusing on the quadrilateral surface displacement in this patients with uh, old patients with acetabular fractures. And we think that the, this displaced quadrilateral surface needs a medial buttressing. I think the next speaker uh, will also focus on that. We need special implants for this medial buttressing. This is a paper um, that we published a year ago. Uh, it is uh, focused on 40 acetabular fractures uh, with um, a displacement of the quadrilateral surface, uh, medial length of stay 21 days. The, um, there was a primary total hip atroplasty together with ORIF in three patients. The, the other 37 patients we observed for three years, and uh, we had a total hip atroplasty in 13.5% of them. If you remember the other, uh, paper that we published a year uh, earlier, that level was 24%. Here it is 13.5%. That means it's lower. Uh, uh, if you can control the, the place and the localization of the quadrilateral surface, you have a better chance of preserving the acetabular cavity for a longer time. Nevertheless, these people uh, uh, dropped in mobility and in activity level, and there was also a decline in their quality of life. So um, as a conclusion of this paper, we said that geriatric acetabular fractures with involvement of the quadrilateral surface may profit from a medial buttressing as part of the open reduction and internal fixation. And we could prove that the secondary total hip atroplasty was needed only in 13.5% uh, um, in comparison to 24% in the other series, it's lower. Here you see a 68 year old uh, male with an anterior column posterior hemi transverse fracture as well. You see here, 
um, the obturator view, the CT scan with displacement, medial displacement of the head, uh, also displacement of the quadrilateral surface, very osteoporotic bone. And here we used a suprapectineal plate of the Stryker company. Uh, you see that um, this orthogonal, so this vertical part of the plate is um, buttressing the medial part of the acetabulum, that means the quadrilateral surface, and prevents a medial displacement of this structure and of the femoral head after osteosynthesis. This is the obturator view and the AP view. And here you see an, another patient, 63-year-old, slipped on ice. She had a T-type fracture, but you immediately can recognize the damage to the femoral head already that was uh, sitting on the sharp edge of the acetabulum. Here, the obturator view and the AP view. And in the CT scan, you can recognize a combination of subchondral impaction together with a damage, a huge damage to the femoral head. Nevertheless, we did an uh, open reduction internal fixation. Uh, after reduction of this head, you recognize this uh, damage to the head. And in the CT scan, here is the uh, AP and the obturator view. And in the CT scan, you see that there was an imperfect reduction due to this uh, area of subchondral impaction and also um, a negative predictive factor being the da damage to the femoral head. And indeed, after 18 months, the patient comes back with a, the development of a secondary uh, arthrosis and we plan her now for a total hip arthroplasty, but still we have now a stable socket that is healed and um, we can perhaps perform a no normal total hip arthroplasty with a normal socket in the acetabulum. Another case is a 78 year old male fall with the, uh, a bike. You see here again, uh, the typical anterior column posterior hemitransverse fracture with the displacement of the quadrilateral surface um, towards medially and a um, uh, no damage to the femoral head and uh, no subchondral impaction in that case. So the main task in this surgery is to control the place of the quadrilateral surface. And here you see a implant that is developed by the pelvic expert group um, where I was member um, of AO. And it, this is a quadrilateral surface plate as well. And it is placed under the uh, anterior plate uh, through the ilioinguinal approach and controls the medial uh, um, side of the acetabulum. This is a post-operative uh, view 18 months after the surgery and you see a nice reconstruction of the head uh, with no signs of arthrosis and with still the implants correctly in place. And this is the obturator view together with the AP view. So at a conclusion, uh, we are confronted with more and more acetabular fractures in the elderly. Uh, this type of pathology is uh, predominantly uh, present in male. There are more anterior fracture types, but we also see more modifiers like impaction, comminution, and head damage. Uh, so we need a thorough preoperative analysis of the radiographic data to see what or to estimate what is the best type of treatment and also to estimate the outcome after an open reduction and internal fixation. If there are no modifiers and there is an excellent reduction, you will have a good outcome. And so we still recommend open reduction internal fixation as a primary treatment for these patients uh, that have these characteristics, even if they are very old. If there are modifiers, there is a higher risk of imperfect reduction because you're not able to reduce this impacted area and to hold it in place uh, every time. If there is an imperfect reduction, there is a higher risk of secondary arthrosis, and we have to change the uh, goal of our surgery, not 
the OREF is not a definitive treatment, but should be the reconstruction of a stable socket for a later, later total hip arthroplasty. I thank you very much for your attention. It is now open for discussion. So uh, any questions from the panel or faculty members, sir? Professor yeah. Robbins, yeah. this is Dr. Pranav Shah from Ahmedabad. It is so nice to I see cannot, you. I cannot see you. Yes, I, I see you now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, we were expecting you, but because of COVID, we could not meet. Yeah, perhaps there will be another occasion later on. Yes. Uh, would be nice Sir, to meet uh, personally. There is a query related to the incidence and the indications of primary total hip replacement in geriatric acidoblem fractures. Can you please elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. Um, the uh, placement of a total hip, especially the socket, in a broken acetabulum always has a high risk of secondary loosening of that acetabular cup. So if you use only a regular acetabular cup, so there is a need to reconstruct the acetabulum to make it stable again before you place a socket for a total hip arthroplasty. And that's the reason we pre prefer an osteosynthesis, a conventional osteosynthesis, not from lateral, but from medial or anterior, as you see that most of the pathology is situated on the anterior part of the acetabulum. And after reconstruction of that, you may perform a total hip atroplasty because you then have a stable socket, but only I would say in cases where the reconstruction of the acetabulum uh, is not good at all and will uh, not give you a good functional outcome where you know that there will be a rapid evolution to arthrosis. So if you want to avoid a second surgery that will come anyway, you can do it in one, in one step, that means in one surgery. But it is for the patient, some of these patients are really ill because they have uh, other diseases, comorbidities, um, cardiovascular and others, pulmonological. Uh, that means that there is a higher uh, risk of uh, complications because the surgery takes longer time and there is also a higher risk of uh, infection if you need three to four hours for the surgery. So that means that our policy is to, uh, to do it stepwise. We will um, to perform an open reduction internal fixation first especially controlling the, uh, the medial part of the acetabulum, the quadrilateral surface. And if um, needed, we will do an early secondary total hip atroplasty um, later on. That may be weeks or even some months after the primary surgery. Yes. So that's our policy. Uh, there are other centers that perform a uh, reconstruction, a bigger reconstruction, and they may they have a socket uh, with a flange that is uh, fixed on the lateral side of the ilium. That is also possible, but uh, we do not have experience with that type of um, hip surgery. I think there is a paper by Professor Roman himself uh, that even if it is not amenable to anatomically reconstruct. Uh, we should try to achieve uh, uh, to, uh, for a osteosynthesis so that the future THR uh, may be easy with a good bone stock. Yeah, you will need an osteosynthesis of the acetabulum anyway, if you want to perform a total hip atroplasty in the acute phase after the fracture happened. So because then you have an unstable situation and you can do some screws um, uh, to provisionally stabilize that uh, and leave the, the fracture paths as they are, but you will never achieve a, a stable socket in this way. So uh, we prefer to do this uh, primary surgery as an ORIF 
and um, achieve an as good reduction as possible uh, to have this anatomical cavity that is similar to what to what it was before and if um, needed you can um, place a simple cup uh, in, into that broken acetabulum when it is healed. Yes. Uh, Professor Romans, I am Dr. Sujit from Orissa. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you one question that uh, is there any condition when you consider resection arthroplasty in extremes of it, particularly in patients in their 80s who cannot sustain surgery for three to four hours or when you see the, all the poor modifiers are there like infection, combination, head damage is there and you cannot operate them for a longer time or the chances... Well, yes, yeah. my question to you is why would you operate them anyway? If they are, cannot afford the surgery, why would you resect the head? No, just to make them pain-free. Just it is a smaller procedure. Is, is, is this a guarantee of uh, being pain-free, you think? Because the instability is not the head. The instability is on the level of the acetabulum. But uh, what I mean to say is that because when the head is there, it will always impact the fracture. It will always exert the pressure on the head. Uh, mm -hmm. on the establer side. So if you resect it by somehow, and if you mo immobilize for a certain period of time, probably you will achieve a relatively pain-free condition. Yes. Uh, if you do a girdle stone, that's a girdle stone situation you create, and yeah. you will, um, okay, the, the patient is taking that surgery very well. And later on, uh, when the fracture is healed, the patient asks you, can I have a total hip? Because I want to to, to move again. I want to to mobilize and then your reconstruction will be much more difficult because you have a shortening of your leg and your trochanter stays high. So I have no experience with that, but if you resect the head would be a definitive solution for one of these patients and not a, a temporary solution in the view of uh, reconstruction later because then you have more problems. Yeah. And do you consider that at any time, uh, whether we should go for a percutaneous fixation and achieve near anatomical reduction for subsequent arthroplasty? Will that be more advisable rather than going for a open reduction and internal fixation with anatomical reduction in such condition? Can, can you repeat a question? I do not uh, really understand what you are asking. Uh, what... In the geriatric age group, uh, can we consider minimally invasive or percutaneous? Ah, okay, minimal invasive surgery. Yeah. Yes, if, if the fracture is not very much displaced, you can do that and bring the parts together, but it is not possible to control the quadrilateral surface with that kind of minimal screw fixation because this is a separate piece. It's very thin, it's displaced and you cannot get it with a screw. You need a buttress plate, as I showed you, there are several on the market uh, to, to buttress this large area. It is a large but very thin area uh, so that the uh, head cannot go medially anymore. You prevent a medial displacement after the osteosynthesis. Uh, Professor Romel. Yeah, I don't see you. Okay, this is Dr. Pane from Belgaum. Okay, good, good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. Uh, to play safe, I mean, if I would say, that you do a fixation and buy time and really find out whether the patient has any complaints after, because many a times, even with little amount of arthrosis, at the age of 17, patients are able to move about. And they really don't come back for a total hip unless they are bad. And second advantage is, because you have gone through an abdominal or an AIP, to do a THR, the posterior surface is totally virgin for you, which becomes easier to do a THR, say a spacing of six months to eight months. So what you're saying is that you would do the total hip arthroplasty earlier? No, if no. You, no. I would I would wait for the whole fracture to unite. Yes. Let the patient but, come without back. Surge, without surgery? Do the fixation. Okay. Wait for okay. the hip to respond to your fixation okay. by time six to eight months. If he comes back for a surgery, you have two advantages. Your bones are now well united. Yes. And approach is a virgin area for you to go in for a fresh approach. 
yes, that's uh, that's what I tried to say you in my talk. So this is our policy, a primary ORIF, Open Reduction Internal Fixation. You do it as good as you can. You control the uh, quadrilateral surface and you leave it as it is. But if you know that your re reduction is very bad, then you may calculate that this hip will not survive very long time. You can discuss with the patient if um, he, is, he agrees to have a total hip shortly after the first surgery. And that you can okay. even discuss before the surgery. If you have analyzed the X-rays and the CT and you see a combination of negative predictive factors, then you can discuss that and say, the outcome or the prognosis of your hip is very bad. Do you want me to perform a total hip immediately together with the ORIF or later on? And you, you certainly have a point, you can wait, perhaps the biological answer of the, of the hip joint is good, but it's not sure. Okay, thank you. So that brings me to this uh, very uh, important question. Uh, Professor Romans, you have a patient who has you. the negative modifiers and uh, the patient has uh, undergone a total, uh, uh, has undergone the open reduction internal fixation with uh, explanation that in future he will require hip replacement maybe in months. So while putting the implants, what care we have to take? Why putting the implants or what yeah, implants? So that while, while putting the implants, what care we should take that we don't have to remove them when we do THR? Sure. You, you certainly, if you do an ORIF, you should avoid penetrating the joint. Also, if you know that you will need a total hip later on. Uh, but in every case, you should avoid the joint to penetrate with any um, impl uh, implant. That would mean that um, you have to resect this uh, um, screws that are intra-articular in case you want to place a normal socket there. So certainly you do your osteosynthesis as if you do not need any total hip later. That means you do your best and you perform the surgery as good as you can, always avoiding penetration of any implant into the joint. So there is this one screw which is described, which goes absolutely parallel to the quadrilateral plate, which may project into the joint at the area of the at the area of the floor of acetabulum, but yeah. which we all know is otherwise safe. Yes, Would I you know this screw. That kind of screw in? You you mean the infra acetabular screw that is lateral to the neuro to the um, obturator foramen and medial to the joint? If you yes. can, if you can. Uh, uh, arrange that, that you place this screw correctly, then you can do it. It enhances the stability of your construction significantly. But if you are not able to place it correctly and uh, you are afraid that it is penetrating the joint, I think you should not do that. Okay, sir. So I will not say you should never do it, but it, I don't say you should always do it. That means you have to see what is the anatomy of this patient, have I placed enough for this uh, screw or not? I think uh, Professor Roman sir has cleared so many of our doubts and given us a very clear uh, indication, guidelines for managing these geriatric uh, uh, acetabular fractures. Uh, I think we should move on to the next feature. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Romans, and we will want to have your comments and your involvement in later on in the program also. Yeah, and I so think I will be back sir. with Hello. I will be back with you in about three weeks from now. Is this correct for the uh, for the yes, pelvic uh, course? So it's an yes. honor. I, yes. I uh, my best regards to everybody. Thank you for inviting me. See you. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. You, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. So. Uh, uh, sir, please carry on. Sir. Yeah, please. Uh, let us please invite our next speaker. So should I share my screen? Welcome, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going with the perception that uh, uh, 
why we need something as Professor Oman just talked about, when there is a involvement of the quadrilateral plate, there is an issue. And that is what I am to talk about in this uh, situation. When we look at these fractures, we obviously, if you look at the area of the fracture, you do see that the femur head has actually impacted inside. And this is a very important perception because here, if you look at the fragment, one goes up, one goes medially, and head is trying to come in between the two fragments, between the fragment which has been pushed up and the fragment which has been pushed medially. And what we understand is that this displacement is in these two vectors, a superior vector and a medial vector. And accordingly, we try putting plate on the superior side and on the medial side. Initially, medial side was not possible because we were not, uh, we were only restricting our serotelian venal approach. But after the modified stopas approach, our medial buttress effect has become much better. And before this alien venal approach, we had kind of a different plates which were used to stabilize. And when they were coming down to quadrilateral plate, they were using these kind of accessory plates over there in this kind of an issue. And we understand that in the body, wherever possible, we have now shifted to anatomical plates, except for the pelvis. But this quadrilateral area required a similar modification. And as Professor Just Roman showed that in the initial pelvic expert group, they made a, this plate, which right now is still available in India, probably has been taken out from the markets abroad. And there is another company, Acumed, which is making a similar kind of a plate. And this is that Acumed company's medial buttress, which was actually primarily being used from ilio-inguinal approach. And again, another kind of a plate which has been evaluated and found was a bigger strategy basically to support that medial displacement in a very strong kind of a plate fixation setup. Then if you keep on looking around for those plates, people use calcaneal plates to support the medial quadrilateral plate and along with the superior plate. Then there came another uh, called new anatomical wing plate. Again, if you look at it, that they will pri primarily support on the medial side with extension on the superior side. So this was a medial support and this was holding on the superior side. And if you are to apply it out, you are accordingly apply in a proper sequential way and you get this kind of a fixation for this kind of a fracture. You can see the fracture configuration as stabilized. Another plate came again with the same perception that you stabilize on the medial side, have excess on the superior side and using this kind of a fixation over there. Thereafter, there was a development of patient specific where everything is robotically designed or computerized and then these specifically plates came now here the purchase is on the superior size buttress is on the medial side then in the pelvic expert group we have got another kind of a plates that were experimented upon for that quadrilateral support some star type kind of a thing some medial support kind of a thing so many of these attempts were made this was another attempt which I myself had patented way back about 15 years back. Another plate which I used in some of the patients, you can see down there also, with the support which could be on the medial side with the support up and going posteriorly. This could be reversed to go on the upside also, so it could be up and down. I used in some cases. Anyway, Professor Oman just talked about this striker plate, which has been one of the most commonly used plate. Again, out of its two variants of this plate, Primarily one with the suprapectineal purchase with the medial buttress and another with the infrapectineal purchase. These were the two variants which were used. Now the question was, out of these two, which one is more important? Is the medial one more important or is the superior involvement? Here in this set, they said that probably the infrapectineal group is, uh, the plate is not very good. But the, another paper said it out that if we have got a superior plate, that gives a much better stability. And then there was a biomechanical evaluation of these two constructs, superior plate construct and a medial plate construct. 
And what was eventually found it out that if you look at this failure load, the best fixation was with the superior with the long screw going across this area, which is relatively critical. Just now, Dr. Pranasha was talking about this screw also and we are in this screw also. So if we are not using these screw, the fixation is bad. If we are using these screws, then this fixation is good. And likewise, if we are not using these screws and just putting a plate, it's not very good. It is still down there. But if we are using this plate along with these screws, then this fixation is one of the best fixation. So we have to have screw purchase around this area to get that level of the stability. And that's the perception. So if then there is a, another paper which said that this inferior plate is valid and potentially a superior method. Because the basic theory still says that you are basically purchasing in a push form over that area as a kind of a tank. Then another plate was uh, seen to be having the similar kind of a picture, but the purchase is either inferior or it is going superior. And again, this is the same paper which Professor Roman just showed about it, that in geriatric cases, he found the medial buttressing effect to be good. Yes, this is agreed upon. Now, the question is what we are looking in all the plates which have been developed till date. We are using a superior plate for a superior vector. We are using a medial plate for the medial vector. Our perception has been that when these two vectors are a part of an injury which is in this direction, neither superior nor medial, why don't we have a plate which is on that border so that we are able to take care of both displacement superior and medial with one plate which is at the brim level taking care of both the displacement rather than splitting into a superior and medial side. So once we consider that the primary force is in this direction and has two vectors, why not to have a force in this direction with a plate exactly over this spring? Now this will be a curved plate, it will not be a straight plate, but then this will be able to counter both the displacement in an appropriate way. We did, there is a IIT near uh, Chandigarh, we try to put up bones there to find out what are our weak areas and what are our strong areas. And we found it out that brim is the most important purchase area. So we thought why not to have a plate which is exactly at the brim level. And what is more? Now, if we are putting a plate on the brim level, it is curved like this over the brim. And as an engineering principle, we know that once it is curved like this, this is much more stronger than a straight plate because this curve, just, just like in the roof of our buildings also, the curved uh, roofs are there because that provides more strength with the less amount of a material. So this kind of a plate is likely to be stronger with the less metal. And then there is a beautiful uh, workup done for the philosophy, for the PhD work that how a mechanical plate should be. When you say an anatomical plate, it has to be within two millimeter from the bone periosteal surface. It's not, it has to be very exactly, so otherwise all the vascularity will go. It has to be within that two millimeter and then it can be called as anatomical plate. Then another AO concept is there that for a better purchase on near cortex, you don't purchase near cortex, you have a direct purchase in the far cortex, so-called the far cortical locking. And another concept is screw locking element that in a given situation, if you plate and you put one of the screw on the either side of the fracture with the nut on the other side, goal of the construct remains much better and that's called a screw locking element. So these were the few things which we went through. So we thought why not to have a this plate and put a nut, which is across the plate here, but it goes outside the bone into the outer cortex at the level of anterior gluteal line over there and gives us a much stronger concept over there. So what we are looking for, now we also understand that locking gives us a better fixation, but it cannot be all locked because that will give a lot of stress rising effect. So a plate must have some locking element, some non-locking element to make it a kind of a hybrid fixation to make it better. So what we proposed was that let's have an anatomical plate. Let's have a screw across through into the going into the posterior column. Let's have a screw into the entry column, which these screw could be locking screw. Then this could be a kind of a locking nut, which goes over there. And then rest of these screws can go into the area after once the fragment has been appropriately reduced. And the next point is this plate 
could be used in any of the surgical approaches depending on the fracture site whenever you have to use a distinction. So this was the first design we made it up with all those criteria we took it up. We took it up a medial buttress at the anterior gluteal line, posterior line, a long hole to put a screw outside, a posterior column. Uh, this is the posterior column screw. This was this the posterior screw was developed uh, as the advised by Dr. Vivek to go more posteriorly. And then we had got anterior column screw. And this was the nut which we were passing from this side inside to outside, a nut and nut screw to give us a better purchase. And this was the kind of the going the first proximal purchase, then the cortical screws. And this is the kind of the concept we worked on this kind of a situation. And this way we were putting the posterior column screw and they were the specific screws. Now, the good thing was that if this plate is at its own place, the curvature is accordingly defined according to our uh, bones. And then it will automatically go into the posterior column and this will be locking. So it will give a very good fixation for the plate to be into that area. And this is all that kind of the steps which I'm not going into. Then we evaluated it on a stress testing machine on an experimental setup. And with the setup, I mean, similar is the setup in the Davos also. So we had the similar setup in IIT near Chandigarh and we evaluated this fixation with the conventional fixation, our fixation with the conventional. We found that our fixation, the proposed implant was giving much better stability into the construct. We evaluated them on the pelvic uh, models uh, with the standard kind of a thing. Then we got it patented in the, this is a US patent for the same plate. Anyway, now I come to the cases. Now here is a case, a 60 years man, you can see the displacement over here, this fragment. We go for a reduction, there is an impaction also, so we reduce the impaction, put a plate and it gives us, a, because it is anatomically supporting it up, once the impaction is reduced, it gives us a reasonably good reduction over there. Another case, you can see it over there, the com this fracture over there. So we put this plate, this reduces back the fragment into its appropriate position and it's buttressing on the medial side. It is pushing on the superior. These are the design. Another case. Now, again, you can see the kind of a combination. The, uh, once you stabilize the ileum, you put a plate. Once you put a plate, the everything falls back into the line and then you are able to get these patients active soon after the, uh, within two or three months, they are uh, walking. And here is a patient, 45, is a younger patient. You see the dome fracture, this displacement, and this is going up this thing. So you can push it from the lateral side also. Now we have a variant of this plate where you have just the lateral half only. So you just push it from that side. It brings everything into proper rotation. And then this is the subsequent follow-up of that case. Another case, again, you can see the kind of a combination here, the quadrilateral plate involvement. And here we are putting this plate. It is bringing everything into the proper alignment and you can see it out there. So this is buttressing on this side of it. Another situation, again, a combination with this thing. Again, you are putting up all these comminuted fragments, putting back with this very fixation after going from the lateral side. The good thing about here is that if there is not much of the combination of the quadrilateral plate, you can have that same buttressing effect with the same plate, the half of it, and you can get that reduction over there to give the patients a back. Now comes the role of this kind of a fixation when there is a combination over there. Here you see it out, the kind of a displacement combination. And once you put this plate, and this is that screw, which could be a nut, which could be a stronger screw, which gives actually purchase in the outer cortex. And once you are able to get that outer cortex, you are able to have a full support in these situations. Now we go to relatively elderly people. Now here, as we were talking about this thing, here, this is the nut which I'm using from inside to outside. And once in this kind of a fixation, you get all the fragments back because now I am anatomically pushing it out. And once I'm anatomically pushing it out, the head is getting back its whole of the estabulum all around it. And then you can definitely mobilize this patient. This is the six months follow up of the same patient able to walk around. Another patient, he's a 69 years man. You can see the kind of a combination as uh, Professor Roman has explained the kind of a combination it is there. So I reduce it out, put up this plate into this area and subsequently you can see I am able to make the patient ambulate to an extent sitting and standing in this kind of a position with this kind of a buttress into this area. Another patient a 71 years. Our aim is basically to get these patients out of the bed and reconstruction remains the primary thing. So I reconstructed bone was poor quality and this is my indication to put this nut from inside to outside. I put a nut over the K-wire 
we, I put a bolt over there and they are interscrewed into each other and they give a very good fixation. You don't have to worry about the length because they will get fixed into each other. So this is the kind of the fixation and this is a subsequent follow up over there you can see and we have made the patient ambulate. Another patient, 76 years, again, you can see the same kind of a situation, combination here. We just buttress it. Now, the good thing about such a plate is that you do not have to contour it. You just have to place it after you have reduced the displacement and then it buttresses it. And then subsequently, you just go for surgery. So, you reduce the surgical timing. You reduce the uh, this uh, problem which can happen in the fixation of the implant. And this is three months follow-up subsequently. Another case, 78 years man, again, it goes through the same kind of a phenomena, reduction, stabilization, and fixation in this kind of a situation. And you are able to mobilize this patient uh, at the earlier time. Now, this is 92 years. Again, we had the same thing. We tried reducing it and we could get a part of the reduction and we are able to get him out of the bed. Eventually, after three years, he got another fracture and then we had to operate him for hip arthroplasty. But for three years, he was walking with this kind of a hip after the surgery. Now, this is the, now the finally, we have come down to this very situation, a plate. Uh, this is the newer design. There were many issues at that stage. Now, here we have got the same, as I told you, the posterior most screw. This is the locking element. This is the medial uh, inside out element. Now, these were the screws because we have to get the screw in the suprastable area. So with the similar kind, simple kind of a uh, screw, you cannot go into this area, but with this kind of a design, now we are able to pass our here. This is the utilization of this very plate. Now you can see it out again, same situation. We are putting it over there. We are buttressing it over there. And with that kind of a fixation, we are able to have this purchase into this area and this kind of a fixation, we are able to achieve it. There is another case with the same kind of a situation. And here we are able to get the fracture reduction going from up down and reducing and then putting it up and then fixing it up and this is the same the good screw which goes from medial to lateral side and the, what i was talking about that we are now able to put a screw from here also otherwise from a standard plate the screws are likely to go into the joint but with this modification now we are able to go into this direction from a very low position over the plate also so that is the advantage we are able to get it so this is the smaller variation of this very plate which can be used if you are going from the lateral side so that it is able to buttress this area if the quadrilateral plate is not commuted now we have just published uh, some 33 patients where we could not really ask all of them to come to us but we did ask their eq 5d scoring and uh, we had a reasonably good outcome in them which we had just published it out. So what we understand is that when you are putting a plate, it must anatomically for the brain. Rather than having two plates and the controversy, which one is better, why not to have a plate over the brain? Column support is an important part. So we have a locking element for that column. We must have options to put screws in various direction. And where the bone is very osteoporotic, we must have that option of using a dual cortical fixation, especially in the osteoporotic bone. So this kind of uh, plate fixation with the philosophy which I have told, we find is likely to help us in this younger patient also, as well as in the elderly patients also, where as Professor Roman said, the bone quality is poor, but still we must try always an osteosynthesis so that later on at some stage we can go for uh, kind of a uh, arthroplasty in that stage. Thank you. Uh, that was excellent presentation, sensor, and the latest modification again I am seeing for the first time. But yes. for uh, the benefit of all the students, I will ask you a few questions. The first one, for using this plate, do you require any special instruments apart from whatever we get in our pelvis tabular set? No, we do not have any special set because the reduction is same and it is rather easier now. What we have, I have not shown for the brevity of the lecture. Three, I have showed you that there are three locking screws which can be applied. The locking sleeves act as holders also. So you just hold the locking plate because in the stopper's approach, you have to get that back. So that locking sleeve in for the central, you can push it that way. And if you're going from the iliofemoral approach, the same locking screw on the iliofemoral approach will allow you to go. So this is the only instrument which is, they are the locking sleeves only, which actually work as handles also. 
and you also have provisions for putting temporary k wires to hold yes. the plate in yes. the position yes you must so that is a very common time. problem we face that when we are putting one screw the plate will shift from the proximal side if you are putting the proximal they move from the distal side so yes. by putting a plate pushing on the plate getting reduction through the plate and then being able to put multiple k wires we have made it much easier now to tackle yes. this practice. yes so this was my concept also that uh, the surgery must be facilitated rather than uh, made it difficult yes also, sir hello is there any other question from any participant related to this uh, uh, or shall i sir? go further with sir, no. sir? first plate i think pre bending to contour is taken away it's already pre contoured yes and uh, while uh, while pre bending it i had taken care of the the curvatures have. i have taken so, care of the posterior column curvature everything so the good thing is when you anatomically put it it will automatically fit at its own place so we will have a three levels we have a small medium and a large size on the right and the left and then we studied about the males and females also the quadrilateral plate area is actually same for both of them there is a curvature difference which is anteriorly and which here also can be controlled but as far as the quadrilateral plate area is technically there is a beta version and some people enroll for the beta version so you do you have that kind of a beta version where we can enroll and we can also use this plate no i mean <laughs> now this plate automatically will be there so because the complexity is little high because i had work for its various contents to make it anatomically better so creating a beta version will be little difficult at some stage but probably it will be there at some stage okay so we can ask, expect it in the market soon right yes yes now i am i am at least happy myself also that we have been able to reach a level because after developing it you start seeing one problem two problem when you are using it you have more problems to come in then you are solving them and then finally you come to a situation which looks to be reasonably okay maybe tomorrow because i remember the first time when vivek rika told me yes it must have a posterior axis and from that onwards that point has always stayed with me in my brain because i found it to be really useful so that way the utilization might bring more comments into it and at some stage probably we might have to further develop and that way we have to remain open for any modification Uh, so if i can just go contact if i can just comment sir it was yes. i have seen the previous version also as you have said uh, this version looks i can really see that it has been done by a surgeon who has refined his own product and model and the best part which i find presently in this model is that you have reduced the metal quantity also and yes. that metal quantity reduction has helped us to visualize our sciatic buttress region in the x rays and post operative also how our reduction is going to be and would be making it slightly lesser in metal as well so that is a very good because in the different views we might be able to on x rays we will be able to have a much better view regarding our reduction and the supra scapular region as well that's what i could gather from oh, that was my concern all these things were yes, my sir. concern at that stage yes uh, so there is a question in the chat box dr pranam can you take this hello yes yes i am going through it yes sir. the present relevance of buttress plates through your femoral approach the question says with so much superior options with aip approach what is the present relevance of buttress plates through ilio femoral approach yes uh, i am not no, no, getting the question very clearly and no, 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 i understand it because yeah. if we have a quadrilateral plate involvement we tend to go from the medial side but if the quadrilateral plate is not a comminuted and you are just buttressing it and the, the anterior part of the pubic ma is not involved it is primarily a uh, medial side uh, primarily a lateral side involvement as i showed in some of the cases i can very well have that reduction from the iliofemoral and when it makes the thing simpler smaller probably that it will be my choice but it can always vary so that is the question that our plate must be usable in every approach thank you so can we move to the next topic sir pranav sir yes i think we should move to the next speaker good evening sir can you please invite and introduce our next speaker yeah so next speaker is uh, dr cp das from katak uh, yes sir you are visible sir so for the benefit of uh, all the speakers dr cp das is one of 
our internationally renowned pelvic acetabular surgeons from india he has done excellent work in extended uh, iliofemoral approach and he is called all over the world to demonstrate his skills and prowess related to that but also he is a great teacher he is a very supportive uh, senior acetabular surgeon and it will be a pleasure for all of us to hear from him sir please unmute yourself sir sir please connect again sir try once more sir your audio is is everyone is able to i am not able to hear dr das So audio is not coming, sir. Audio is not coming. Sir, uh, audio mute. Nice. Sir, unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute. He is unmute, but uh... you will have to check your audio connection, sir. previously it was there he was having a discussion what i call call no no you are not audible sir somebody call him on his mobile and tell him yes i am calling but he is not picking up I started the talk, but it's not audible actually. Yeah, I think uh, somebody should call him, or we may have to put a message in the box that we are not able to hear him. And in the time that he may re-log in, probably he will have to leave and re-join. Uh, in the meantime, can we have uh, the next uh, talk? If we are not able to hear him now, he may have to leave the Zoom meeting and re-join. Yes. is someone calling him yes yes but he is not picking the phone actually yeah i think he'll need to restart his laptop or desktop whatever he is using this happens sometimes in zone se koi ko chat chat kar lani Okay. Am I able to? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Now you are audible, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There was a so you can start from the beginning, sir. All right. Thank you. Yes. Um. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, Uh, excellent talk by Professor Romans, uh, Professor Sain. I expected from them also. So I would like to share my experience with the choice of surgical approach in the management of complex astrolabe practice. See, at the end of this talk, we should be able to find out which fracture is called complex, and what are the different varying degrees of complexity in the astrolabe fractures, and we can choose the appropriate approach for that particular fracture and understand the factors. we decide the complexity and the surgical approach so what is a complex fracture actually if you look for it you will not find any correct definition there is no consensus most people speak about the displaced both column fractures which are hard to reduce as complex there are different degrees of complexities depending on the type of fractures this is the only paper which i found describes the complexity it says the fracture personality not the fracture type you see you have got the simple fractures associated fractures as per littoral classifications but the fracture personality is different from the fracture type fracture personality involves a lot of things which we will discuss in the later part that actually decides whether the fracture is complex or not and this is a paper from david halper from new york 
and he treated complex acetabulum fractures through single non extensile exposures. This is what he said the displaced two column fractures could be treated by focal Langen Beck or Rylingonal approach and indirect reduction by large femoral distractor or fracture table or lateral trochanter fraction. But he failed to define the nature of complexity. I suspect these are not very complex fractures. This is from Timothy Bray from Reno, and he said that if you treat these displaced both column fractures with dual approaches, you get significant advantage of visualization of the fracture reduction. This is what is stressed. A complex fracture, if you reduce under vision, it gives a much superior results. So, Dr. Helfet said single approach, he said dual approach. My personal experience is that when the management comes to acetabulum fractures, which do not appear straightforward, I would consider them as complex fractures. Like, you know, when you get a WhatsApp message, the moment you see, you know what approach you are going to use. If you cannot decide at that moment and you really need to go through it a little bit, see the experience, see the CT scans, decide, agree with something, then decide with. No, that is the type of fracture which is actually a complex fracture. CP sir, sorry to interrupt. Your slides are not moving, sir. Not moving? No. No, sir. And also make it full screen. Uh, are you, are you, you have to make slides so. It's in the slides only. Actually, your slides are not moving, sir. Actually. Is there a problem with the net? Yes, uh, you can make oh, it. It has started moving. We can oh. go back. It started moving? Yes, but yes, you have to uh, slide. Yes. Can you can you hear can you see now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now it is moving, sir. You start from the beginning a little bit. Okay. Yeah. You want me to go back from the beginning? Yeah, Sorry. Yes, sir. Because the slides are moving. Right. Please tell me if I uh, if it doesn't work. I don't know why it's not happening. The choice of surgical approach in the manager of complex acetabular fractures. Uh, as I said, at the end of the talk, we'll know what are the complex structures, what complexity, and whether which approach you want to use for which complex structures, and the factors which decide the complexity and decides the approach. Sir, please make it full screen, sir. It is full screen only. You have to make it slides here. Sorry. In the um, below the panel, there are very. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Is it third one? Third one. It, it, it is clear. Is it okay here? Uh, now it's clear. Uh, now it's clear, sir. Is it okay? Is it full screen? No, sir. It is not full screen. You have to go to the down and uh, make it full screen. It is just showing the slide mode only. The panel will is. Yes. Just on the lower side, lower right lower side, side, find the magnification. Side. Just near that. The fourth, the fourth bit is. Uh, is yes. it this one? That one. That one. Sir. Is it okay now? No. This one. Sir. This one. This one. Yes, sir. No, I, I don't know. I told, I'm not able to see. Uh, is it full screen now? No, sir. You have to stop sharing, and again, you have to make it slide so, sir. Okay. But give me for all this happening here. Okay, I'll I'll do it again. I'll share the screen and uh, and now just fourth fourth uh, bid is uh, yes. This one? one is that one, sir. That one. Yes. That one. Yes. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. No, no, not yet. No. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, this is okay. We'll, we'll go over to the choice of surgical approach in the management of complex fractures of acetabulum. And uh, at the end of this talk, we'll know what is a complex fracture, what are the varying degree of complexity, how to choose the right approach for which complex fracture, and which factors decide the complexity and the surgical approach. Is it full screen now? Is it's okay. Now it's okay. It's okay, it's but it's not full screen. I'm so sorry. I don't know why. You can okay. There is no clear definition on the complex fractures, but you are able to see my slides, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. There is no consensus. It mostly speaks of the displaced both column fractures. There are different degrees of complexities. 
This is the only paper which says that fracture personality, not the fracture type, the main determinant of the complexity. Like if you want to know whether it's complex fracture or non-complex fracture, you cannot simply define by the describing the fracture type from the total fracture. I think, I, I think I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll try to do it again. Could you please ask Dr. Prashad to go ahead and do it? Let me fix in the meantime. Is it okay, Kishore? If it is not happening, then, I mean, you will be waiting. Let me just try to sort it out. Yeah. Kishore, you can call Dr. Prasad Gurunani for the next talk. Sir will come after 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Let me just uh, fix it while it is happening. Chita, sir, we can move on to the next talk. By the uh, time Dr. Prasad will finish, you can sort out and uh, uh, we can... Yeah, that's what, yeah, please go ahead. Yes, sir. I will stop sharing now. Yes. Okay. Dr. Prasad. Uh... Yes. 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 It is visible. Visible, audible? Yes. All right. Thank you for the invitation, Kishore. I'm glad to be part of this program. Thank you. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon who does some adult trauma. So my introduction or objectives is I want to let you know that this is uncommon for a regular pedia part. The adult ortho part don't feel comfortable taking care of kids. So this practice is not being treated appropriately. These are usually low energy injuries. And sometimes they come reduced after a dislocation. And unless you have a high index of suspicion, you have missed these injuries completely. And the most important part is the main difference between children and adults is uh, there's a lot of cartilage in the establishment. So the large fracture fragments are either missed completely or their size underestimated. And stress examination that you do in adults routinely can be tricky because the children are small and I probably can dislocate a native hip if you push hard enough under anesthesia. So in a dislocated hip, it's pretty easy to re-dislocate with the stress exam, so you need to be careful. This is the classification of standard textbooks about pediatric uh, establishment fracture. Is a type one is a small rim fracture from dislocation, like a wall, to wall fracture. Type two is a linear fracture in the, in the main establishment, but they're stable, means non operative. Type three is linear fracture with hip instability. I don't know exactly what this means. And type four is fractures with central dislocation of the hip. To look at this, these are patterns that are commonly seen, but one, three, and four are all associated with hip instability, like dislocation. So that's the main crux. In pediatrics, most often, hip joints, when they uh, break the establishment, there's often hip instability, like dislocation. I don't know how to use this classification very well, so I use the modified adult principles, whatever I learned in adult uh, orthopedics, so I'd apply them in pediatrics. When I do examined anesthesia, I'm more gentle, I don't push as hard as I can when I look for stability, but I urge you also to look for range of motion, especially internal rotation and flexion. Right? I'll show you an example of why it becomes important. Non-operative care is more uh, prevalent in pediatrics. One, because people think that children will heal fine, so they put them in a cast. You can reduce and put them in a cast sometimes, but you put them in traction for months with low morbidity. The indication for open reduction and fixation are similar in adults. Any incongruity, you don't accept. Any instability, you don't accept. Any major step or displacement in the weight-bearing area, you shouldn't accept, because pediatric patients do not remodel joint deformities. Then we use SSD in adults too, but SSD becomes more important in children because of the examples I'm going to show you, because you need to look inside the joint more often. These are not column fractures you can fix indirectly from uh, the inside or uh, uh, without looking in the joint. And you can modify SSD in a young child if you want to do an SSD, you do an abductor tenotomy rather than GT uh, osteotomy to prevent growth problems. This is the difference in adults and pediatrics. Development, cartilage. Pediatric hips a lot of cartilage. One is a triradiate cartilage, the growth plate of the physis of the stabulum. So facial damage in a pediatric patient can cause post-traumatic establishment dysplasia from a growth arrest. Professor Gan very confidently stated in multiple meetings that this happens only in children under five years of age. 
What happened to see examples of six year olds to seven year olds with the growth arrest. So I'll say eight probably is a reasonable age when you probably don't need to worry about hereditary cartilage damage. I've done previous ever osteotomies going across this, this cartilage, nine and 10 years old with no consequences. So eight probably is a reasonable age when you worry about hereditary growth arrest. Is an example, a salter one through the hereditary cartilage, the salter two, both can have a five component, we can have a growth arrest and develop a solid spatial like this. A retroverted, steep, shallow uh, socket. The second important thing is, there are a lot of cartilage in the establishment that may be unossified. And among all, the posterior wall ossifies the last. So if somebody has an open hereditary cartilage, we know pretty sure that the restyle is not fully ossified. So whatever you see on X-ray is not accurate. This is an example of a younger child, more of a somewhat seven or eight-year-old, wide open triadated cartilage. I basically don't see any wall, no anterior wall, no posterior wall. I just see half of the posterior wall. I'm not even sure that fully ossified. Here is an example of an older child, more of a 12-year-old. That's the posterior wall. That's an anterior wall. There's a crossover sign. You know crossover sign is abnormal, but with open triadated cartilage, Crossover sign is a normal finding because the posterior wall has not ossified yet. Now, instability. Instability is a big issue. That's why we do the stress exam more carefully. Like I said, if you push hard enough, you can dislocate anybody, but you get a good feel as to how unstable the hip is. If there's any instability, we, we usually get an MRI to look for cartilaginous uh, fractures and abnormalities. I'm going to show a case example. He was 11 years old boy, trivial injury, sliding on a sled on a slope in America and snow, and the leg got caught and he got dislocated, posterior dislocation, got reduced, it's pretty concentric. They did an exam at the outside facility but did not document very well saying that it's very stable or unstable. They said they examined it and it sort of felt unstable but they didn't re-dislocate or they didn't tell me how unstable it was. So we got a CT scan, a 3D reconstruction. We saw a few flex, two or three flex of small bone. So we all sat there looking at it and said, oh, little flex, what are we going to do? We can't fix that. So we probably should immobilize this kid for a longer time. But as you looked at the cut, it looks like these fragments may be together. It, showed, it does show up very well here, but uh, I'll try to brighten up my screen. But all these small pieces seem to have a relationship to each other. They're not separate pieces. Again, if you look here, it's more clear. This whole thing is one piece. It looks like two small fragments. This whole thing is one piece. And it's as big as the entire posterior wall on the opposite side. So this was a huge posterior wall fracture that appeared like two small little fragments that are unfixable. You see how this 3.5 screw, two 3.5 screws were put in the same fragment. So this fragment has to be pretty big, right? To put that, that big, that much, that, that many screws and buttress play, standard adult uh, type of uh, fixation. So I urge you to get the MRI in a pediatric patient with open hereditary cartilage to look for fractures that you may, you may miss. Incongruency is very common in pediatrics. 25% of hip dislocation, fracture dislocation, like incongruency in the, of the hip. They can be labrum folded in, wall fragments that are not visible on X-ray or CT scan. They can be head fractures that may not be visible. They can be soft tissue interposition. And one study, a relatively larger group of children showed that a small flex sign on a CT scan means a larger fragment. So either you operate automatically or get an MRI on these patients. And like I said, SSD is very safe and should be the uh, approach of choice to look inside the joint. Here's an example of a 10 year old child. If dislocated, reduced back, no fractures seen. But you, you obviously see the incongruity. Right? With an MRI, the labrum and the entire articular cartilage folded in like a flap. Right? There's no way you can get this out with the, anything short of actually dislocating the head again back. So I was able to reduce it back. This is the fragment and just sutured it and was stable. So post reduction MRI is strongly indicated. If there's any instability on your exam, 
But again, instability is a relative thing. You can push hard enough any pediatric chip out. So I think routinely, post MRI is a good idea. We published a study uh, showing that patient I showed you earlier, and a couple more with Hardy, my resident, and two other people also recommended uh, that factors are being missed uh, on, on uh, X-ray and CT. Two other papers said MRI shows a lot more, a lot more, even when there's, there's no instability and no incongruity, there can still be stuff in the joint that may not be visible on X-ray and CT scan. So it's a good idea to get an MRI post-reduction. In this flex sign I told you already, in a CT scan, a small little fleck of bone can be a large fragment. Then, this is the last point I want to make. I believe that most hips that dislocate or fracture have a morphological predisposition. We did a pretty large study in our uh, trauma center, looking at all the hips that dislocated posteriorly and found that majority had increased alpha angle, increased anterior coverage, and posterior deficiency, a retroverted establishment. The three papers to support our finding, we didn't publish ours yet. We presented it in a couple of uh, national conferences, but didn't publish yet. But there are other papers to support it. The impingement predisposes the hip to a fracture dislocation. The one paper said that said dysplasia may predispose it, but this has not been my experience. Here's a case example 15 year old, close perioded cartilage, small little wall piece, posterior dislocation, reduced reasonably well congruent. It looked like on this x ray. Look at the opposite side, there's a crossover sign. Is a retroverted establum or anti over coverage. So that's supposed to wall on the injured side. Very deficient, normally 50%. Very deficient. And this piece is making you more deficient, the post to wall piece. Small piece, but significant. That's an anti wall, anti over coverage. So he has predisposition to impingement that probably levered the head out with the low energy. And he also has a cam morphology, the round head, bone is outside the sphere, that's cam morphology. Again, decreased internal rotation. This paint also had a loose fragment of joint that I didn't pick up on X-ray. So it's a regular CT scan of the pain. The posterior wall piece was pretty thin and long, but based on the deficiency I saw, preoperatively, the long thin piece. So when posterior took the piece out and put that piece back together, hoping that uh, the posterior deficiency will, will be mitigated with the intact capsule and uh, putting the wall back together. And we also repaired the labrum way down below with an anchor. And this is a little aggressive, but because I, I do a lot of hip preservation and impingement surgery, and impingement predisposes somebody to instability, went ahead and did a cam resection arthroscopically, but you can do it under SSD under, under the same approach also. And then we realized that he's impinging on the other side. So when I did a camosteoplasty on the other side also. So in conclusion, I say there's a lot of cartilage in pediatric patients. So make sure that you evaluate for the cartilage, either examine for stability and then get an MRI or routinely get an MRI post-reduction and look at all the frag fragments and take care of them appropriate. Thank you very much. Pranav sir, are you? Pranav sir, are you there? Yeah. Yes, I am here. Yes, sir. So, any question uh, from the uh, speakers? Uh... Yeah, I would, I would, I would ask uh, Dr. Prasad to please uh, elaborate how it is different going in into the acetabulum of an eight-year-old as compared to a 28 year old because i think many things are different uh, many precautions will have to be more so i think if you can elaborate more on that it would be benefit to all of us right so so the most exposure you're going to get inside the cell will be a surgical dislocation approach so surgical dislocation an older patient or an older person do a trochantic osteotomy to preserve the attachment of the muscle it's easier to refix but in a younger child, like an eight-year-old, a trochantic osteotomy probably will cause trochantic growth errors and lead to haxa valga, which can lead to more instability afterwards. So the standard approach in a younger child is you do an abductor thin anatomy, glutus medius tendon will be cut all the way across, so we can repair it afterwards. 
and not disturb the dead with cancer. And afterward, we do the same surgical dislocation approach, preserve the blood vessels in the back, the external rotators are also preserved, and then you do your anterior capsulotomy and anterior dislocation. Then you can push the head backward and uh, look inside the establo and uh, fix it. Yes, I've got two questions to Dr. Prashad. First is, uh, we understand that in an adult, the chances of avian with that kind of a dislocations are standardized. But in a pediatric patient, when they have already got relatively a defined vascularity, and when that dislocates, considering the five-cell separability, are these chances more in a pediatric age group patients? Or do we have the same kind of age? The numbers seem to be around 10%, pretty similar to the adult population. So again, if you do a surgical dislocation approach, you can actually see the vessels, the whole path, and you can protect it quite nicely. So you can see the retinaculum really, whether it's intact or not. If you really want to, put a sterile Doppler on the retinaculum, and you can hear the pulses all the way into the head. And second, what we have seen, you might be in USA, so you might not have seen those neglected estabulum fractures. Up here in India, we have seen a lot of neglected estabulum fracture in pediatric patients also. And what I was surprised when you see them after five years, seven years, ten years, they have got a lot of adaptability, just like remodeling at else, other places also. Even in the estabulum level also, there is a lot of remodeling, and these people, these children are doing much better in spite of a very bad deformity around that area. So, uh, because we were always uh, doubtful about an articular area giving us a remodeling, but that is what we have seen. Any any idea about that? No, you seem to have a lot more experience than me. The old, the most chronic fracture that I've seen is somebody who came four weeks after uh, the injury, and I was able to put it back because together. We see totally neglected also, and we have seen a lot of these cases, and they have beautifully modified the rest of them into still into a very working kind of a situation due to their uh, age group as such. Because the adaptability at later stage may not be there, but in the pediatric patients, they do have adaptability in the rest of them also. I mean, that is something surprising to us. How long have you followed them? I mean, is it like uh, eight years, eight years, ten years like that? Oh, okay, they do well for eight to ten years. Yes, yes. No, I mean, they look to be quite okay right now. Where we went their old for uh, x-rays also they were dis they were definitely bad okay. but they were never operated upon and uh, they have been to this situation and they have adapted very well yeah i have no experience or knowledge about it okay. hey dr prasad can i ask one question please sure yeah uh, thanks for a great because this is a very uncommon thing which we see in trauma centers of india and as dr sain has said the same um, my Question is regarding what is the fixation? Is the fixation different in a pediatric acetabular fracture as compared to the adult one? Can we just go or come out with screw fixation or we definitely require the plates as well as you showed in your case? And the second thing is in your experience with the pediatric trauma and especially the acetabular fractures, which is the common fracture pattern? Is it posterior and posterior walls, which we should be looking for? What message we should give to the general surgeon and as well as for me in a trauma center to look for in cases besides the flex sign in a pediatric hip? All right. So two questions. The first part, uh, is the fixation different? Yes. Uh, no, actually, I, I use adult principles like I told you. Pediatric textbooks write a lot of different things without clinical uh, experience or uh, studies. So it's more of an expert opinion. Of people who are not very experienced in my opinions. I've taken it from the adults and the copy, and you can put screws across and plates across pretty, uh, what do you call it, uh, generously in the pediatric. Only the ones you need to watch for are the really young children, where you want to cross the growth plate with your previous fixation, like a five, six year old. The second question. Uh, uh, the fracture pattern, as well as precautions. Uh, Can we hear them? Dr. Prasad, please unmute yourself. All right. So I didn't realize that I muted myself. It is, the second part of the question is uh, the patterns of uh, injury. Yeah. The patterns are predominantly wall fractures, either a posterior superior dome or posterior wall fractures. Okay. And uh, Interposition is very common. Things will fold back uh, easily. 
the labrum and uh, the cartilage is still and folds back like I showed in the case. And a few examples were of central dislocation through the triated cartilage. Uh, that, that's not uncommon either. So those are two common patterns I've seen. Okay, thanks. Uh, one request, or I would say a suggestion to Dr. Prasad. Uh, sir, since we have a kind of a algorithm or a protocol for any patient, adult patient in uh, with pelvis acetabular trauma, that we first do the first X-ray, then the obturator iliac X-ray, then when we suspect something, we could do a CT scan. So do you have some sort of that algorithm algorithm in the pediatric age group where a patient with a relatively normally looking X-ray, but you want to evaluate it further by a CT scan or MRI because the patient has A, B or C symptoms? Yes. Uh, so the standard textbook answer is you get an MRI of any hip that has instability and you don't, you're not sure if it's an operative uh, fixable fracture or not. In a pediatric patient, MRI for instability for sure. But I would recommend personally that you get an MRI in everybody after uh, a fracture dislocated of the establishment because you can miss a lot of things uh, on a CT uh, that may be operated. So my, my, my protocol is you get a you, re you reduce them, do an examined anesthesia, look for stability and range of motion, and then uh, get to post reduction X ray. CT plus or minus, but I get an uh, MRI routinely. Okay. Yeah, good evening, Dr. Prashad. Yes. One question, just one question. Yeah. Uh, regarding uh, probably exposure to uh, acetabulum fractures uh, in pediatric, probably we have got less experience and it has been a really nice talk. Uh, regarding the safe surgical dislocation, probably it's easier in adult population to by doing a trochanteric osteotomy. As you told in pediatric uh, age group, you can't do that. Uh, you have to do abductor tenotomy. And how do you repair it? Any tips for actually how do you repair it? It's straight side to side sutures. Uh, I don't do non absorbable, but if you're concerned, non absorbable suture is probably a reasonable idea. But keep in mind, above eight, trochanteric growth is not a significant problem. So, nine and 10 year olds can get a trochanteric osteotomy. You're talking about really young patients, like under eight is where you probably should not touch a trochanter and do a abductor tenotomy all the way across, leave a cuff on the trochanteric side. And repair it back. And you actually can put sutures into the apophysis, the cartilage, because the needle will go through the cartilage quite well. And you can get pretty good fixation. But you just don't want to go across the uh, growth plate of the trochanter, more at the base. And you can you actually put drill holes or go through, go through the bone with the abductor tendon, with the tooth of the needle. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have just finished three talks. We have to a little bit more uh, faster. Uh, so can we uh, move to the next talk? Uh, Tita sir, are you ready, sir? Yeah, yeah I'm okay. Yes. Uh, I hope it works this time. Yes. And um, please do let me know if it is not working because I just restarted the computer. I have yes. not done anything else. So wonderful talk by Dr. Prashad, but I could not hear most of it. I think I'll go through the recording. And if I have any query, I will call him and ask him. So, Kishore, is if, it, if I... Now it is visible full slide, sir. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. So, we'll be talking on choice of surgical approach in the management of complex fractures of acetabulum. So, there are two things. Surgical approach and the fracture personality is a complex fracture. So, at the end of the talk, we should be able to find out what makes the fracture complex, what are the varying degrees of complexity of the acetabulum fractures, how to choose the right approach, and the factors which makes the fracture complex and decides the surgical approach. What is a complex acetabular fracture? There is no clear cut definition on that, no consensus. Mostly people speak about displaced both column fractures, which are hard to reduce, are called as complex fractures. There are different degrees of complexities. This is the only paper I found, which has described that the fracture personality and not the type of fracture is the main determinant in this complex, uh, deciding this complexity. So, it's the fracture personality. The fracture personality includes a lot of things. The fracture type, the uh, time since injury, the age of the patient, the soft tissue injuries. So we'll, we'll talk about it. So the, basically, the fracture personality des decides the complexity, not the fracture type. If retornals, all associated fractures may not be complex. There may be a simple fracture which can be complex if it is added with 
other adverse factors. This is a paper from David Helpett who published his experience with non extensile exposures in complex vascular fractures. I think he described everything well, like he, he fixed them with either or copper Langen meg approach, used indirect reduction tools, but he failed to describe the nature of complexity. I suspect these are not very highly complex fractures, so they were amenable to fixation by non extensile approaches. This Timothy Bray from the United States, Reno, he published his experience and he felt that the displaced both column fractures reduction by dual approaches of a significant advantage of visual fracture reduction. That means he improved the reduction by checking the reduction visually in complex situations. My personal understanding is that when the management of a fracture estabulum does not appear straightforward, it is probably a complex fracture. Look at this particular one. See this, everybody would say this is a very simple uh, posterior dislocation with fracture of the posterior wall. Everybody agrees that you reduce the fracture close, check for the stability. If you are not happy, go inside, cocker Langenbeck approach, fix this fracture, and you are happy. But when it is already 145 days old, the whole personality of the fracture changes. This man was a he sustained dashboard injuries, he had an open patellar fracture, the patella was treated by the surgeon. He forgot to check the hip joint, sent the patient home. Patient did not walk. When he did not walk, they attributed it to the psychological impact, so they treated with psychotherapy. Till one of my senior professor kindly saw him, spotted the diagnosis, and sent this patient to me. And if you see Litonel's uh, paper from 1979 in International Orthopedics, he has categorically, from his large experience, he has explained that fracture dislocation, hip posture dislocations, up to 160 days, 25% of the hips are viable. They can be. Uh, they can be reconstructed. Beyond 160 days, he did not find a single case without AVM. So this is 145 days. We discussed with the patient, looking at his age, we asked him whether he wants a ORIF or he wants a fusion of the hip joint if the head is dead or an excision or even a THR. So we plan that we would do a fixation. If it fails, we will do a THR. So we used a copper language back and a trochanteric costume, not the flip one, but a proper uh, full blown uh, trochanteric osteotomy. You'll be surprised when we uh, approached it, we found the femoral head was bleeding. But uh, when we cleared the acetabulum and reduced this as, uh, into the acetabulum cavity, the bleeding stopped. This, this happened several times, and we realized that this is because probably the medial circumflex vessel is getting thin or stretched by the scarred tissue or the uh, adaptive shortening of the soft tissue. Uh, through which it is traversing, like on the surface of the operator externus or the capsule of the hip joint, and that is causing the uh, stoppage of the bleeding. So I had I had already gone into copper and back approach. I had to do a periastabular capsulotomy and check keep checking whether this bleeding is returning. Then I had to do ileostomy stenotomy, and it happened. It started bleeding. When I reduced it to place, I had great difficulty in getting the trochanter back to its place. I had done a trochanteric osteotomy at that time. So trochanteric osteotomy, to get it back to its position, I had to do something you do for the max space release in BIC. I had to elevate, taking care of the supracutial neurovascular bundle. I had to release it from the outer surface of the ilium, the hip abductors and extensors. And you see this, this was bleeding, this stopped when it is reduced. And this is the def defect which was seen. And uh, this is the bone fragment which are united elsewhere and still viable. And it was put back to place and fixed. This is one year old x ray. This gentleman came after two years for a checkup. You see, knee is stiff, but the hip is mobile. At the end of eight years, he came with his daughter with a supracondylar fracture and I checked his hip joint hip and it was fine. So, this simple injury became complex in my understanding when it was neglected. When you see this one from the beginning, you think it's a complex one because ABC fracture with a floating dome. When the integrator of the wet bearing dome is considered to be an important prognostic factor and that is involved, you really need to worry about getting the wet bearing dome back. So, this is a complex one and this is the floating dome. This is the coronal CT, this is the Mata Zufa angle which involves this one, and you see this is the bladder which is repaired in the front, which is revision repair, and patient has got sacral soap. So, you, are, you know, you cannot go from the front, you cannot go from the back, then your options are. Extended This is not a straightforward case 
I consider this IBC is made more complex by the associated bladder injury and the sac also. So complexity of the acetabular fracture is influenced by anatomy and personality of the fracture, associated visceral injuries and bony injuries, soft tissue conditions and the time elapsed since injury also affects the complexity. When you look at the personality of the fracture, these fractures have got straightforward answers. Either they can be done through the front or the back, but these ones from the associated types require uh, deep thinking whether you want to go by non-extensile approach, dual approach or extensile approach. Even this one in the transverse transrectal type, you have the same situation. So the fracture personality of this set of fractures is different. So personality of the fractures is the main factor which decides the complexity. The approach as David Helfetcher could be non-extensile as uh, uh, your uh, um, from Breno, uh, you, they said that this is a dual approach. Nobody mentioned about extended from approach, but I consider this as an approach for these kind of cases. Depending on the fracture personality and surgeon's experience and reduction tools, you have to decide and do these fractures. How to decide the surgical approach? These are the common approaches which we most commonly use. Most of the fractures can be fixed by using this one or combination of these fractures. These are non extensile approaches. And when you need an extensile approach, you need to do the extended ileophoral approach. Look at this uh, ACPST, this is a schematic presentation. This can be fixed through a stopa or ileohumeral approach very adequately, and you can drop a screw from the ileohistial screw from the brim, and the fracture reduction is straightforward. This is a non extensile approach, but when it is associated with a dome injury or a posterior wall injury, you cannot finish the surgery just doing this. You really need to look into how to reach the dome or how to reach the posterior aspect to repair the posterior wall. Let us see some cases. We will see some cases on extended aliphonal approach. I will also show you some cases on dual approach and we will decide which one is preferable. This is a lady who is 26, laborer, run over by a tractor. The picture which I showed you, rupture bladder repaired and the sacral sore. And this is her x ray. And this is the fracture articular part, the dome which is floating. This is the vertical metaphyseal part. We need to get this onto the roof of the acetabulum because we cannot go from the front. You cannot go the medial side. And you uh, have to give a dome to this uh, head of the femur. It's already 20, a 27 days old injury. This is the Jude view, CT scan, 3D CT. This is the front which is already affected by the bladder surgery. The challenges are the anterior axis denied, posterior axis denied, and you need something like an extended aleophonal approach to access both the columns and reduce the dome onto the head of the femur. This is the, the site was isolated from the sacral sore and the blood repair. This is before the reduction, after the exposure, you can see the head of the femur uh, uncovered. This was reduced and fixed. And the main goal here remained that we should get a dome over the head of the femur and check that the dome is in congruity with the wet bearing area. And we ignored the anterior wall and column beyond the ileopicnal eminence. This is three weeks post op. You see the x ray. You see the only we have taken care of the dome area that is congruous and well reduced. We have not cared about the other part of the hip joint. This is 14 years follow up. You can see that this head is the congruity at the dome is still there and patient has a functional hip joint. This is not a recent picture. This was taken about four years back. I don't have the recent picture. I spoke to her. She appeared to be fine. But this is the last x ray which shows she has a pain free mobile hip joint and the x ray shows joint space in the wet bearing dome is fine. And if this hip requires a THR later on, we don't have any problem. It has already served many years, many, many years. This is a 22 years old, 22 years old lady and a fall from a height of 30 feet and blunt from her chest. She arrived on the 11th day post injury. This is a type 2 ABC fracture. This is an enlarged view of the AP view. This is a Jude view. Our main concern here is to get the dome and the rest of the acetabulum okay, which is very difficult unless you have access to anterior column, posterior column, anterior wall, and the dome. And this is the CT scan. It shows that the dome is tilted over here. And this is a 3D CT scan, the front floating anterior wall fragment. This is the loose body in the joint, and this is the lip of the acetabulum. So the diagnosis was low ABC. I told you challenges, I think we need to graph the voids which have been impacted to give further stability. The choice of approach was 
either dual hyaluronic copper lingam neck with proprietary costotomy or EIFA and Fanon's too. I choose the latter. This is through the extended hyaluronic approach. On my right is the head, on my left is the foot of the patient. And you can see this part of the uh, bone is so carefully repositioned, reduced by putting one screw each into this bone because it would not hold more than one screw. And there are three plates which are holding the fragment in place. And the soft tissue attachment to this small fragment is intact. So there is no fear about any avascular necrosis despite its large exposure. And through this blue arrow, we put, put laughs into the void, keeping the head reduced so that it is well impacted and stable. This is the immediate uh, post of x ray. This is at the end of three months. This is at the end of one year. And you can see that the hole in the trochanter from where the graft was taken. This is her functional status no hip abductor extensor weakness. And the hip is full range of movement. Now, no Brandenburg gait. And you see the functional outcome. This is a slippery floor. She walks very carefully. She currently lives in Hyderabad. Uh, she is now three years down the line, but this is one year follow. She is absolutely fine as per her statements on telephone. I just called her to find out before I made this presentation. So she is actually fine. So despite having such a bad injury, communicated type 2 uh, fracture, uh, she did very well uh, with an extra dialectal approach. In fact, we had a meeting, webinar with Dr. Joel Mata and Dr. Keith Mayo and uh, Michael Oransky a uh, few months ago. And I was surprised that though Extended electronal approach is not mentioned, the indication is not mentioned at the type 2 ABC fracture. Joel Mata and Keith Mayo showed cases which are only ABC fractures. I think they have to revise the indications and add this ABC fracture, low ABC fracture, as one of the main indications for this kind of approach. This is a ABC with extension sacroiliac joint. This again a 26 year old male, high velocity injury, he has got a floating dome, anterior column high, anterior column fracture, fracture extending to sacroiliac joint. This is the uh, axial CT, uh, sagittal coronal CT. You can see the dome is completely pulverized, so multiple fragments. So we had to, uh, this is 3D CT. We plan to go in and flip this fragment up, reduce the head of the femur and onto the reduced femur, put the head of the femur the articular cartilage into its place and then graft it. Uh, this is for immediate post of X-ray. This is uh, Jude view. This is at one year, and uh, this patient is doing well. Though I have no scope to see him because of COVID situation, he is doing well. This is the surgical exposure. So ABC with a floating dome. This is a 26 year old man, isolated injury, ABC. Again, he has got a floating uh, fracture in the dome. We need to take care of that. This is a sign which you, where you really need to. You cannot really reduce it to reliably to the uh, head of the femur and keep in the normal position. To avoid articular degeneration. So, this is the ABC fracture where you find the superior vessel is at risk when it is exiting through the greater sciatic notch. The, on my left is the pre reduction x ray, uh, intra view, and on the right is the uh, reduction maneuver done to, using the large femoral distractor to get this uh, dome fragment in original place. This was reduced using the distractor. And this is after completion of the reduction. Some missing bone fragments. If they are missing, don't try to make up by squeezing the fragments uh, to produce an anatomical looking uh, exterior. This is the post op extra. This is a 10th year post op. And uh, this is how he was at the end of 10 years. And uh, this is at the end of 16 years. He recently had a fall and a DBL fracture. I removed the proprietary screws, which are loose. And he still has a very good uh, functional status uh, after this surgery. This is no abductor weakness, no extensive weakness, no rotational issues. So this is a pre-op and a pre-op X-ray and CT scan. This is a post-op at the end of 16 years. The transrectal transverse fracture in a 45 days old injury. When you see this, you don't know what to do. Actually, this is a gentleman who could have a hip replacement surgery, but he did not agree because he was already 48. And this is a 45 days old injury. And this is the CT scan. Head has a hill stretch lesion like Dr. Romans showed us. And this is the only leap which is available onto which you have to reduce the head of the femur with the hill stack region. You have to do an anatomical reduction. Otherwise, this hip is going to sublux it medially. So, extended eyelid femoral approach with transarticular arthrotomy. You can see the reduction was done under vision. Absolutely anatomical uh, reduction. 
this is the gap which was seen after the reduction maneuver was done and this is the lip which was uh, lying there to support the head of the femur if you leave it like this with a step the head will wear out in no time so this is how this was reduced and fixed under vision so this is possible only by direct reduction this was the original x-ray 3d ct and the uh, sagittal uh, coronal sections this is the x-ray and this is the post-op immediate post-op x-ray at the end of seven years this gentleman is doing well at the end of 10 years he has got some evidence of sclerosis and some arthritic changes but this is quite a difficult one only extended endofemoral approach can give this uh, reduction and stability to the hip joint so abc with dome involvement is a late presence and an engineer who's 26 26 years and he came after three weeks this is how he came absolutely uh, the head is dislocated medially and the dome fragment is lying loose and uh, these are the CT scan pictures and this was uh, straight away external femoral approach this was the approach which was used and uh, this is how we we focused on the dome we got the dome reconstructed immediate post-op is at the end of 11 years he has got a beautiful dome completely congruous hip joint and you can see the functional status of the gentleman he has got excellent rotation no uh, uh, extensor abductor weakness hip to range of movement you can see he walks down the stairs without much uh, limp, no pain, and uh, he again goes up the stairs. This is actually after making me walk a few times. I cannot tell how many times, but this was done in the hospital, my hospital, and uh, he is absolutely fine. So, this is an excellent result for such a bad injury. I will show you some experience with the dual approach when I did not uh, use the extended dual approach. This is type 2 ABC. Dr. Prasad just now said that if you have a young patient, there is a chance of damaging the uh, broken rib blood supply and having box alga later on. This is a 13 year old girl who came with this injury. This is a type 2 ABC fracture and I decided I could have done through external electrode approach but I decided to do dual approach. And uh, this is a low ABC. This is the, I would like to show you actually this was a video not playing. The uh, ileal neural approach when, when I irrigated I, a lot of articular blocks came out to that. So if I do through the external electrode approach and do a hip dislocation, surgical dislocation. I can put all those articular blocks into place and fix them. But during this washout, after fixing the back, when I did the ileal approach, same sitting, the washing out the articular blocks came out. That was that was I was not very happy about it. So it was 13 years, and this is the post-op X-ray. This is the magnified view of the post-op AP view. This is the articular uh, congruity seen, and this girl uh, started mobilizing. Just this, when she's getting discharged, this is the picture. This is at the end of two months. This magnified view again, Jude view. This is at the end of 10 years. This is she's showing some signs of sclerosis, but no reduction in the joint space. And this is a Jude view. And uh, this is a magnified Jude view. 17 years follow up. She currently lives in Bangalore. This is her uh, hip getting arthritis, sclerosis, reduction in the joint space. And this is a significant reduction in the joint space. I think she will end up with a THR soon. And uh, I wanted to review her, uh, this oblique view. And uh, so this is her functional status. Her husband took these pictures. I, I never knew she got married. This injury, and this is the current status. And she sent me some pictures with dancing. She is dancing in the wedding. So her functional status so far has been good despite losing a lot of articular blocks. So I, as Dr. Sen said, a lot of remodeling happens. Even Dr. Joel Mata was giving a talk, I was listening, a lot of remodeling happens in children. So I think this is for a very rewarding one. So in summary, this girl of 13 years had ABC type 2 significant combination, had bilateral, uh, had simultaneous uh, dual approach, 17 years on and she has a very much functional hip. I tried to score on telephone was 16 by 18. And this system to operate her with dual approach uh, was good. But I would do a EIFA if she was skeletally mature. I would still get a better results with that. This is again a 45 year old engineer, a fall from a height. And he had a closed head injury, which stopped me from doing EIFA. This is a late presentation. You can see uh, this looks completely malunited. I had a big struggle. This is a low ABC and uh, articular block. And uh, the decision whether to operate or uh, not operate because he was not a compliant patient, head injury, surgical approach, no EIFA. 
So we decided to do AIP and copper Langenbach. And this is, uh, we use the columnar reduction force to reduce these fragments together to the lateral window of the AIP. And uh, you, we use the large femoral distractor, one sand spin in the abdominal wound, one in the lateral wound to jack out and to loosen up the malunion. And uh, uh, this was the uh, lateral window. We use the columnar reduction force to reduce the, hook it into the ischial spine. Uh, which is checked through the uh, abdominal wound and reduce the posterior column onto the anterior column. And uh, it required very powerful tools actually. We had to use the King Tom, uh, original synthesis King Tom, to apply sufficient force to get it reduced because it was pretty much marinated. And then, of course, we did the rest of the fixation. And uh, I'll show you his. Uh, this is the approach which he had, the lateral window and the anterior window of AIP and the copper Langenbach. This is at the post of, I don't know how many days after that, but... Uh, sir, little bit faster, sir. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead. Yes. Uh, this is seven, seven months and this is 11, seven years, this is 11 years now. He's doing well and he has a hip which is still functional. And uh, this was the original X-ray on the left and the right is the post of 11th years. This is the ABC, post of all is simultaneous dual approach. Again, another gentleman. Uh, operated to dual approach. Uh, his current status uh, is at the end of 18th year. He has a 50% reduction in the joint space, sclerosis of the joint margin. This was my first case, 1995, and the X ray is pretty bad. That's a trans transrectal transverse fracture. I did through dual approach, 1995. This was 10, 10 years post op. This was the approach. And this is the gentleman on my left, he's 10 years. This is under 20 years. He broke his ankle and came to me. And this is the 20th year. His hip is still functional. So, 20 years follow up, this transsectal transverse fractures dual approach has been very rewarding. Summary uh, complex acetabular fractures are mostly displaced, both column fractures, transsectal transverse of one elementary type fracture, which is again considered as complex fracture because of this personality. Fracture personality is a bigger determinant than the fracture type of complex fractures. A simpler type could become complex if the personality of such fracture changes adversely. And the approach for choice of multiple uh, for the complex type fractures remain between dual approaches and external aleutonal approach. My experience favors extended aleutonal approach over dual approach. Non extensile approach suits fresh injuries less complicated. Surgeon's training, advanced instrumentation, and experience influences the surgical approach of your choice. Thank you all for tolerating my long talk. Thank you. I think uh, the question we should take at the last. Uh... Of the session uh, so because there are uh, another four talks uh, thank you uh, so can we move on to the next talk uh, professor Tirka? Uh, sir you have to uh, stop right. this thank you Chita, sir you have to stop uh, yes. Yes, sir. I have already stopped. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, I still cannot. <laughs> So it is not coming for me yes, again. Yes. The same. Uh, you can you see my slides? Yeah, you have. Uh, can you see the slides? Not, not no slides. Yes. yes, it's there. Can you see my slides now? Yes, yes. You, you have to make it slide show. Can you see the slides? Uh, sir uh, your network is poor i think you have right. to stop your so, uh, okay okay so, is it a slide show now Sir, your voice is breaking. Actually, your network is poor, I think. Hello. Hello. Sir, your voice is breaking. 
Dr. Sika, slide show. Dr. Sika, may I suggest if you switch off your video and just play the slide, it should be okay. I think your network is not supporting the uh, network is a little weaker. If you switch off your video and just uh, present the slides, it should be fine. So uh, we can move on to the next talks, uh, Vivek sir, if till the time it is sorted out. So uh, Dr. Pradeep uh, Namad, uh, you can move on to your uh, talk, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, am I audible and visible full screen? Yes, yes, you are audible and with full screen. Okay. So, um, um, I would try in this talk to put a crisp message uh, on how to manage the entire dome impaction fragments of acetabulum because it was already been uh, touched upon by Dr. Uh, Professor Romans. So uh, my job would be to uh, put a crisp presentation about uh, what is the entire dome impaction and how to manage it. So uh, that is the place where I work. Okay. So um, uh, Dr. Angelin uh, um, uh, published this article in 2003 where he described this gulf signal, so called the anteromedial dome impaction, and he said that these patients, even though they have reduced well, they um, have problems of inadequate reduction, early fixation failure, and um, joint narrowing and subluxation. So that is what is uh, the negative predictive factor which he has noticed in his study. And then he has uh, written that this particular radiographic sign, also called as a girl sign, has a 100% predictive of failure of reduction and of fixation. So he said that it can be because of two reasons that in first place, that this superomedial or superanteromedial location of this dome impaction is difficult to access. And the second is that even if you are able to access it, it is difficult or sometimes impossible to get any bone graft or hardware applied in a manner to reliably support the fragment. And that's what um, was quoted in 2003. So the solution uh, to this was to improve the access to that fragment and improve the fixation. And around the same time, the AIP started uh, picking up in the late um, uh, first decade of uh, 21st century. So if you see the mechanism of injury of this anteromedial dome infection, so typically it will occur in the anterior wall fractures or the transverse fracture or the fracture or a uh, anterior column with posterior and transverse fracture. So these are particularly either a central or an anterior kind of a uh, vectors which will try to produce this anteromedial dome infection fragments. So uh, when, a when a force is applied to the acetabulum and the force is dissipated, it breaks the acetabulum into multiple places. But what can happen is that if the subcondyl bone is weak, the force transport to the outside or um, the other table does not occur uh, or it will occur only, only after the impaction of this fragment. So this is the this is the typical uh, injury that we can see in a weak or osteoporotic fractures where the subcondyl fracture fa uh, fails and the fragments get impacted and the head will go in. So that is type one kind of fracture. Another type of fracture is that when you are high energy trauma and the acetabulum breaks and the head is trying to go inside, but while going it, it will just chip one fragment of the acetabulum and that will cause us another small impacted fragment. 
So either we can have a large impacted femur like this with a typical failure of the subcondyl bone or a small impacted femur like this while, while the head is exiting out of the acetabular medial. And so that will typically produce the gull sign into the uh, x -ray. So if you see pathological anatomy of the seagull fragment, it is typically located just below the iliopectinal brim. So if you see the iliopectinal brim, just medial and posterior to that, uh, uh, just superior to the head, that, that will be the fragment that will be located. So all your lateral approaches, the lateral window or the iliofemoral approach, or for that matter, sometimes iliofemoral approach, approach, um, accessing this fragment can become difficult. So um, uh, to improve the access, we need to up our game in iliofemoral approach, iliofemoral approach, topa approach, or um, nowadays we are using a pararectus approach. So uh, <clears throat> we can reduce uh, the fragment first, the, the column fracture, and then we can make a small window there, and then we can tamp that fragment down. That is one way of fixation. Or another way of fixation is directly reducing the fragment like that, as it is shown here. So we open the fracture site, reduce the fragment, and then put a bone graft, and then we kind of put a, another plate. So we can support the quadrilateral plate first with one plate, and then open the fracture, and then put graft there, and then we close. Or we can do the other way around. We can put the, the suprapectinal plate, open the quadrilateral plate, put the graft, and then we can close the uh, quadrilateral plate. So this is another method of uh, fixation. So this first method is what we I call is a periphery to center reduction, that we reduce the column first, that is periphery, and then we reduce the center. And this uh, fixation is called as a center to periphery, where we reduce the dome vector fragment first, and then we cl the close the lead and create the hydraulic and just put it so that is a central to periphery reduction. So uh, nowadays, uh, when uh, the anterior intrapelvic approach has come into picture, uh, the access to this fragment has come has become pretty much easier as uh, opposed to it was earlier. So nowadays, we can see this fracture end on when we once we lateralize the fragment, we can just reduce this part, this osteotom there, and then put another osteotom on the top of that and hammer this osteotom down so as to reduce this fragment and then we can fix it uh, with whatever method that is available at your disposal. So this is the typical yeah. fragment uh, that has been uh, accessed through the SOFA approach. So we can see that this is the fragment and that is access to the SOFA approach uh, and then we can just reduce it down and then we can fix it with whatever position that is. Or if you are using lateral kind of approaches such as a iliofemoral approach or a subingon approach, then you can use this um, um, L uh, punch kind of devices which can go below the fracture and then it can reduce it down. If required, you can even create a small window there to push that fragment down and then you fix it. Now, as far as reduction methods are concerned, uh, there are uh, the first and foremost principle is lateralization. So we put the shank spin in the head and then we lateralize the head. So uh, <clears throat> that is the first, so we create a space for the fragment to move. There's no way by which we can push the head by manipulating the fragment itself. So first we need to pull the head out and then manipulate the fragment. So first principle is lateralization. And then we can have a center to periphery or a periphery to center reduction. So this kind of a reduction. So first we lateralize the head. We put a shank spin inside, we can lateralize the head. And then this dome impacted fragment, we can push down and you know, kind of support it with whatever implant that is available like this. Or another way as it's been shown earlier is that we fix the periphery first and then make a small window and then tamp that segment down. As far as fixation method is concerned, there are two aspects of fixation method. The one is the subcondyl support and the other is the peripheral buttress. The subcondyl support can be accessed, can be provided by either autologous bone graft or you can use autologous structural graft such as a bicortical or a tricortical graft of iliac crest. We can use uh, various kinds of cement there and we can put a metal that is a buttress screw that can be passed either from medial to lateral or anterior to posterior direction supporting the dome impacted fragment. So <clears throat> this is what is the, uh, the uh, uh, reduction. And then in this case, these uh, authors have put um, the lateral to medial screw and the anterior to posterior screw to fix this fragment. And sometimes you can even put some kind of cement there to support that fragment. Peripheral buttress, uh, you can use either a supra plus infra pectineal plate. You can use a specially designed quadrilateral plate or you can use a hook plate from the ilofemoral approach. 
it has been beautifully discussed by Dr. Ramesh Sinsev uh, in his uh, first talk, the different kind of buttress plates and what kind of um, plate can be used. So uh, the, uh, when it comes to the dome impression fragment, I would like to use two separate plates because you know it gives me um, the um, freedom to fix one part of the fracture so as to create a kind of a, and reduce the fragment, put a bone graft and then close other part of fracture. If we want to use a specially designed quadrilateral buttress plate, then, you know, it will reduce the entire fragment at once. And then we need to, you know, kind of make a window or something um, uh, to the, um, uh, to the plate. Uh, uh, we had to work through the window of the plate and then we can reduce this fragment. So my personal preference is two plates like this. So I use, so in this case, uh, this is a quadrilateral plate, that's the dome impacted dome. So we can use the intrapectinal plate first. So that's the intrapectinal plate, this is the obturator neuromuscular bundle. And then through this, you can manipulate it. And then you can put a suprapectinal plate. It gives a lot of freedom to the surgeon to work around by fixing one part of the fracture and then working onto the dome. Another way of doing it is a kind of plate like this, which we can obliquely bend and try to put onto the quadrilateral plate and then we can fix it laterally and that will support the quadrilateral plate. Okay, so a few, uh, two or three uh, crisp cases. So this was a case, a T kind of fracture uh, uh, with the impaction. So we can typically see this is a fragment that has been tilted here. CT again, we can see that this is a fragment and through the stop approach again, we can see this fragment which is there. So it can be reduced to the top approach. We can put some bone graft there and most important thing is your buttress screw. So all this screw is going to go in a subcondal area and that will support the fragment. Now this um, is a particular case is a 82 year old female, mother of a doctor and she had this kind of injury, pretty innocuous looking X-ray. And here also we can see that the fracture line are barely moved. However, if we can closely observe the acetabulum on this side, which is spherical and acetabulum on this side, which is kind of oblong, we can notice that, you know, there is a gradual compression of the superior dome and that is uh, allowing the fragment to go medially. So we can see this uh, uh, fracture line in the scrolling view, the impacted fragments. And we can also notice that the head, which is lateralized on the other side, on the uh, affected side, it is medialized. And you know, that is uh, the kind of uh, uh, um, impression that you can go uh, get by uh, 2D coronal images. And we can also see the tilt of the dome, whether it has moved subtly or not. So same way which we can go, we are laterally the head, slowly try to convince the fragment to go down. You take the fragment slow, uh, millimeter by meter, millimeter down, and then put, put bone gap there, and then you can put a subcondal plate, and then you can uh, subcondal uh, KY, and then you can put all these two, uh, these two plates, and that's how, what is the reduction at the end of the fixation. The most important is this uh, subcondal uh, buttress screw. So that's a subcondal buttress screw. And then we can see that this what was the pre-op medialization, medialization that has been reduced. And this is the pre-op medialization and that is the uh, lateralized hip of the post-op. And this patient is um, uh, at the healing, uh, around, I think one year post-op and she's walking independently pretty uh, confident and the hip, we can salvage the hip even at this age. Now this is relatively younger patient, uh, around 60 uh, year old male farmer and he had this T fracture with impaction again. This is a small impaction fragment as opposed to the other fragment, the small impacted fragment. And then this is a T fracture. Uh, he had sacral fracture on the other side as, as well with the symphysal disruption. And this fracture was treated again by this topa approach where we lateralize the hip, we put the fragment down, tamp it down, then put a bone graft, close the lead, fix it with temporary K wire, and then we pass two screws and then this subcondal buttress screw. So these are the subcondyl buttress screw, and that is the rest of the fixation, like the posterior column screw and the screw for the sacrum and the sympicel plate. And this patient is now, now uh, this uh, um, uh, video is around uh, one year post-op and he has joined all his duty. So, uh, so uh, take home message is that we need to identify this entity. We need to know that there are these two different types of these fractures. Um, uh, STOPA or AIP gives very good access to these fragments. And uh, the two most important uh, thing in managing is the providing the subcondyl buttress and peripheral buttress to the cortical fragments. Thank you.
so dr nemade is leaving so any quick questions so one or two questions to him uh, because he has to catch his train sujit sir any question one compliment to him excellent talk thank you Uh, excellent very really excellent yeah. so yeah dr namand uh, namade have you operated any cases through pararectus approach no no uh, our friend dr ashok raju is doing it uh, we are yet to uh, hop on the bandwagon <laughs> okay no he is not yeah. shopping man <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, thank you dr nemade for joining us it was a wonderful talk uh, i think uh, you must be uh, hurry yeah. to uh, thank you so can we move to the next talk uh, uh, professor uh, sorry i have to yeah yes you are visible sir so can you hear me and let's see my yes 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 video okay so sorry for the trouble technical i think our computer also is like us it gets hanged in between when it is on for too long and uh, this talk was supposed to be after professor dr cp das talk of extended ileo femoral and it would have been very relevant if i could have made it at that time because one of the oldest techniques and one of the most latest techniques would have been just presented in front of you right in the same context but let's see what is the role and after dr nevada's talk slightly it will be a simpler talk for you because this is showing you how exactly a anterior intrapelvic approach can be done so i'll just describe for the younger lot who are listening to this how we can access and the critical step of modified stopa or intrapelvic approach learn through cases the various methods and steps of reduction which have been told by dr nevada and identify the indications and also some limitations in my experience what i have faced with these intrapelvic approaches first of all let's understand this is more a basic talk for the younger people who want to venture into intrapelvic approach that it is an extra peritoneal and an intrapelvic approach which we do which gives us an entire an exposure regarding the quadrilateral plate and the inner brim of pelvis we can usually divide the anterior pelvis into four major things which we have to fix the anterior column the quadrilateral plate region the iliac blade region and the far cortex of posterior column so these are the four major things which you can fix from the anterior side so aip approach gives you exposure to the anterior column posterior column and the quadrilateral plate the only thing which it does not expose complete extent is the iliac blade region that's the extent of the aip approach and once you combine this with the lateral window in fact you get the entire exposure from the si joint till the symphysis so it gives you a complete exposure from the for the anterior approaches and all the four things which i told you and you can get exposure of fixation also and you can expose and fix them so our point for number 1 which we need to understand is the access which we get through intrapelvic approach is similar to ileo inguinal approach which is right from si joint till the anterior side and it also gives us exposure much good exposure of the quadrilateral plate region all iliac blade anterior column posterior column and the quadrilateral plate can be seen when we use it with the lateral window with or without asis or stot how to do the approach we stand on the opposite side as we know we can have a transverse incision or a longitudinal incision depending upon our surgeon's preferences we open up the rectus we need to have some instruments which are special for this and then only we will be able to do this abdominal retractors are required and some sort of cobra retractors are required which is slightly different from most of the other things which we do then we understand the anatomy corona mortis ligation is the key structure in anterior intrapelvic approach which gives us the exposure to the quadrilateral plate the placement of retractors will help us expand the exposure and we need to mobilize the obturator nerve and the neurovascular bundle to enhance the access 
like in ilioinguinal approach or any anterior approach you need to cut the iliopectineal fascia to get an exposure to the false pelvis because you are start working in intrapelvic approaches from the true pelvis so you go from center towards periphery in intrapelvic approaches whereas in iliofemoral or in ilioinguinal you tend to start from the false pelvis and enter the true pelvis so this is the corona mortis which you need to cut and once you ligate it you can lift up the external iliac up and the obturator down and then play around the quadrilateral plate region so that is regarding the surgical exposure the fixation options as you have already seen by dr pradeep that we can have an intrapectineal plate we can fix the quadrilateral plate region we can fix the posterior column just like we fix from the opposite side in cocker lengenbeck approach and this is how you can place the retractors one on the pubic tubercle region one on the anterior column near the iliopectineal region the third one in the iliac fossa and the fourth one below which is pushing the bladder down as i said the plate placements can be infrapectineal or suprapectineal depending upon which fixation you require and which method you are using for the production and fixation so now it brings us to what all the fractures we can fix through this intrapelvic approach in my experience i would say that choose your initial cases well otherwise you will be disheartened take simple anterior columns with mild quadrilateral plate displacements in young patients as your first cases not the elderly osteoporotic patients which we have seen over the last three presentations by dr romans dr sen and pradeep they may not should not be the first cases otherwise sometimes you will have failures which will dishearten you so let's start with cases this is a 20 year this is how this is my evolution for intrapelvic approach and i want to share it with you this is a 20 year old female rta fractured leg with slight subluxation which was reduced of the medial side which was there you can see that it's an anterior column with quadrilateral plate fracture the ct scan shows posterior column intact it's an anterior column with a quadrilateral fracture simple fracture in a young patient not much of iliac blade only anterior column quadrilateral plate and with impaction obviously because that's invariably a part of such fracture patterns so what you do is you take this case intrapelvic start your stopa with this or intrapelvic approaches put it push it the quadrilateral plate and the column back small plates these supraacetabular screws the two screws are the key fractures which are stabilizing elements and you get a fixation pushing back the quadrilateral plate and the column back to this and she was fairly good even now after it's now 8 to 9 years of her follow up that i have and one of my initial cases when i started in 2013 or so then once you are confident of managing such then you take your medial subluxed cases which have gone inside which is purely again a quadrilateral plate region look at the fracture pattern it is not involving the iliac blades it is not involving any other fracture major displacements only the medial quadrilateral plate region with some amount of impaction so this is the fracture pattern anterior wall quadrilateral plate with mild posterior column undisplaced fracture and the same approach with a slightly bigger plate now you have become confident you can put in three screws supraacetabular you can try to put in your infraacetabular screw as was discussed this is that infraacetabular screw and come out with a single fixation for your medialization of that fracture fixation then an elderly more patient once you are confident looking at the marginal impaction classical anterior wall combination with quadrilateral plate displacements which are higher you can see the marginal impaction here and this is how you fix it with a small fan and steel incision putting in two plates one for the buttressing of the anterior wall or the suprapectineal part and the second which is infrapectineal holding the quadrilateral plate in a proper place that says follow up around 3 years which is fairly good once you are able to do this fixation of the complex fractures with intrapelvic approaches you have got these columns which you need 
anterior column, quadrilateral plate, medial subluxation of the hip, iliac blade, and posterior columns. Remember that you have to fix all these fractures while you are going from anterior side. Initially, if you have dealing with a complex fracture, then you might take care with a bigger incision and then start stretching your limits. This is the case. Now a subluxation with going higher up. You can see that the posterior column is going very high with an anterior column displacement with some amount of SI joint or a sacral fracture as well. T e type or anterior column with posterior hemitransverse displaced anterior wall. So now you need to come till the symphysis, go towards the back and fix your sacrum as well. Here, the principles remains the same. You reduce the hip as was shown, fix your pelvis first, stabilize it on the back side, put in your screw, which you have to reduce it. I put in as long a screw because this was not more than that. So we could have not put in a transsacral one. Then coming from the lateral side, as well as the symphysial area, intrapelvic, you can fix and reduce your quadrilateral plate the anterior column and the posterior column. This screw with reduction from the quadrilateral plate region, the screw has been put from the lateral window. And then you go anteriorly, fix your plate completely towards the front and you can get a fixation which you want. I'm showing you evolutions, how you improve upon your complexity of cases so that you can learn and master this approach because this is the approach of the future all young surgeons have to learn this now because this is the approach which most of your instruments, even the plates device are for this approach nowadays. No other plates are there. Remember, Dr. Sain has devised a plate for intrapelvic approach, not for ilioinguinal one, which can be used, however. So this is how you fix that. Fix everything with the iliofemoral approach as well. And this is later on when he was having some urational structures and all. So when we got his six months follow-up, you can see it remains the same while he was RGUs and these things were done for his urinary problems. Once you have done that, now you start stretching your limits and I'm showing you complex fractures now, how widely displaced fractures now can be fixed with the lateral window and stopa approach. Imagine and see the amount of displacement, which is this fracture is having, how medialized that fracture, the entire hip joint has gone medialized and the primary stable fragment is lying here and the entire hip joint is inside. So again, you reduce it, traction or lateral pin, fix the quadrilateral plate from the stopa side or intrapelvic region, utilize your lateral window, put in two plates now. We started with single plate. Now we are increasing the complexity, putting in two plates. Now you increase, put in two plates, completely right from SI joint towards the symphysis and the infrapectineal one with the supraestabular screw fixation and the infraestabular screws. And that's you the fixation which you can get of such a medialized fracture, iliofemoral along with intrapelvic approach, which gives you a near anatomical fixation for that fracture. So the reduction tips are lateral pin in femoral head, picador or ball spike on the quadrilateral plate with reduction, Contouring of plates right now because we do not have the anatomically contoured plates available to us at present. And fix the strong areas of fixation, which are mostly the supraestabular screws and the pubic rami or the symphysis, which you will get on the medial side. What are the contraindications? Remember, it's not that everything is rosy with this. Posterior wall displacements or combination of the posterior column is not so easy to get fixed with intrapelvic approaches. So don't venture here. When you are in very much into intrapelvic, then only you go about fixing them. Mosterior, most of the posterior displacements, which are very high, go by posterior standard approach. Doesn't mean that all fractures need to be fixed through intrapelvic, which are ideally suited, do that. If posterior, go posterior. These are the problems. Many of the ladies, recently I had a lady who had four caesareans done. For such case, I would not venture into from the intrapelvic side with the stopa approach because of the fibrosis and the adhesions between the bladder as well as the rectus. So there you will have to follow and go back to your ilioinguinal, the good old ilioinguinal approach. 
So that's one of the recent intra Ilyengo annual which I did over the last five to six years, I would say now, because of cesarean four times. So see always in a lady or in a male regarding any previous abdominal surgery because this will negate your intra pelvic approaches most of the time, and also as we are very commonly seeing neglected fractures. Do not. That's my personal view, which we have seen and published also. Do not venture into an intrapelvic approach for a medialized fragment for more than three weeks old fracture. The granulation and the fibrosis is so big that you are not able to differentiate the obturator vessels from your granulation, and you need to remove that to access your quadrilateral plate. This is the paper on intrapelvic approach that we published last year in Indian Journal of Orthopedics, where we had 64 patients followed up as well as over the last five years from 2013 onwards, where prospectively followed up. And what we were able to conclude was, yes, it gives us very good exposure. Only three cases needed to be changed to ileoinguinal once we were learning this approach initially. But the cases which presented late, and those were the cases which we needed to shift to ileoinguinal, as scarring and granulation leads to inadequate visualization and can disturb and damage your vascular structures. So remember, it's not so. Some problems are there. This we have already seen, so I'll skip this, that it was an intrapelvic, how it is done, the quadrilateral plate impaction. These are the views, CT images. That's just exactly what Pradeep showed. Put in a cobs, reduce that gull sign, push in your bone cement or the bone substitute, put in your K-wires, and then with the infrapectineal and suprapectineal plates of those same patient, that's what we commonly use. I many a times use a longitudinal fixation and fracture uh, incision instead of a fan and steel for such cases. The supraestabular screw, which is holding that, and you are putting in the bone grafts to get back your proper doming of that. Once you are expert, you tend to extend your limits and think that everything can be done through this intrapelvic approach. This is a 65-year-old male, osteoporotic, medial subluxation. See the amount of subluxation and the impaction. We tried to fix it with the intrapelvic and iliofemoral, achieved a fairly good congruency. You can see that impaction had been reduced to a great extent. But six months later, it failed. We had to convert it. And as we saw, saw by Dr. Romans also, we had a good walls and the things, bone stock. So we could go from a virgin cocker Langenbeck area or the posterior side, do a cemented hip because of the issues and even come out even with a cemented hip for such a fracture later on for this patient. So in the end, I would say, Know the limits of your approach as well as your self-expertise. You cannot play God all the time. We should know when to go in for some other approach or for a fixation or a salvage, depending upon the patient. Avoid complications. Remember, in cautious, be cautious in superior medial dome impaction in elderly. They may give you a failure. Not all cases will be rosy for you. So in take home, it is a less invasive approach. It's definitely from all the intrapelvic approaches. And once you combine it with a lateral window, it gives you complete exposure, which you want, both to the anterior column, quadrilateral plate. And along with lateral window, once you use it, you can use it for all the anterior fractures. Be cautious in delayed cases and in elderly cases. Thank you for your patient here. Uh, it was an excellent talk and uh, uh, correctly said that once the fracture is more than three weeks, uh, it is very difficult to dissect the vessels uh, from distal to proximal. So I remember one of my cases I operated, I injured the external iliac vein. So I have yeah. to convert it to iliangular and I have to hold these uh, bleeders and uh, to repair, then completed my. Uh, so, All right. So. Thank you. Any any question uh, quickly or we'll move? I on. have a small uh, observation that I have found during AIP. Patients, I don't know whether the, this is true or not. Young, obese, very protuberant abdomen, dark colored skin who are beef and pork eaters. Their abdominal musculature is so tight. I mean, if it is a protuberant abdomen, sometimes it is a task to dissect through AIP. 
I don't know. We'll have to really look into it. You know, those thick muscular, they are not actually muscular, but the skin texture is so thick that it becomes difficult to go through AIP in this patient. Retraction becomes a big problem. Anybody has experience in this? Dr. Kale, take a profile of the patient. <laughs> no, I would. Uh, yeah. I, I could hear you. I said you take the thyroid profile of the patient, the thick skin, you know? No, no, but I have observed, we have uh, tried to, you know, uh, analyze. All of them were four keters. I think uh, uh, the anesthesia part is important. We have to uh, under GA. Uh, so that gives much freedom to retract. Uh, uh, there, if I can add to that, there are, we have been doing obese patients as well. But... In fact, the problem in obese patients is to go inside and do the surgery because they have got a two, three inch layer of fat out there. I find that's a contrarian view, but I find the elderly obese patients to be very easy to operate because they're near because they're uh, because the tone of their muscles is slightly less. And you can the tone is less, so it is able to retract it easier in an obese patient. Fat is definitely there and to get the access towards the intrapelvic approach and the plates becomes difficult. The, as you said, GI is good. Also, erasion or you can say slicing of the rectus from the anterior side of your pelvis and the pubis symphysis, that helps you a lot once you are going in and erasing the rectus. So that's, I find it definitely difficult to do that in a labor person who is a very strong labor class who is going and doing a heavy manual physical person who has got his six packs ready for them to reduce and lift up your rectus. Those are the patients I find difficult. That's my experience for them. Old age patients are not, they are quite lax. Yeah, so, uh, can you move to the next talk? Is it audible, sir? Uh, Kishore, one last question to Dr. Trika. I wanted to ask him regarding the length of the drill bits and the depth gauge and taps. Does he have to have longer instruments uh, for doing this? Uh, sir, all the cases which I have done for the last 10, 8 years now, I have not used any specific instrument for this acetabulum. Even the retractors, I have used the normal humans for all my fixations till now. The only other instruments which I use here is a curved picador, which I had made 10 years back of my own and the divers and the uh, one or the abdominal retractors, which we have. Excellent. Harrington and the divers. Those are the only two other things which we use. Otherwise, all the standard instruments right now. <laughs> But let me add a point that the AO group is coming out with the specific instrumentation for AIP in which all these tools are relatively longer and even the screw holder and they are having all those things which are relatively longer. We might have those specific uh, lengths. Yeah, there is a small, Dr. Yes, small sir. question. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, whenever you are going for this. Uh, uh, intrapelvic approach, uh, the incision you made, whether, whether it's a horizontal or a vertical incision, is there any specific consideration? How do you go about whether you want to do vertical or horizontal? How do you decide or anything? You can go anytime. Uh, that's as, as I said, I've used both of them. You can say equally among my 70 odd cases, which we had done, but it's a surgeon's preference, which becomes. But any case in which I have got a doubt that I might like to change it into an ilioinguinal. I definitely go with a transverse incision. But the standard regular fractures in which I'm going to go and fix that, I somehow, that's my own personal bias, I would say, that I feel that I'm able to cut the rectus quite proximally and I'm more confident. So my exposure of the supraacetabular region, that's my personal bias. I'll again repeat that, that I feel I get a better exposure of that area with my longitudinal thing, but it is more that I can dissect out my rectus. I feel much better when I'm using a longitudinal incision than a transverse incision. But whenever I've used to use an ilioinguinal, 
I, if I have any slightest doubt, I use a fan and steel approach for that. Okay, thank you so much, sir. I think Kishore, you can start your talk for the time. Yeah. So, uh, uh, good evening, teachers. So, it is a very uh, relaxing to speak in front of uh, our own teachers. So, uh, my topic is posterior wall fracture. Uh, buttressing with a plate is not enough. Uh, someone has rightly said that the familiarity of the posterior approach to the hip, uh, sorry, uh, the simplicity of the fracture pattern lead many surgeons to treat the postural fracture when they might otherwise refer more complicated acetabular fracture. If we if we review the literature, uh, we can see that 88% of the uh, fra uh, fracture fail with conservative treatment and 37% failure with the open reduction and fixation and 30% uh, itself fail in the first year of the fixation. So my learning objective in this uh, talk is defining an emergency in the postural fracture and timing of fixation, evaluation of the stability, addressing the combination and placement of plate, how to deal the delayed cases and impacts and injury, and lastly, the heterotopic ossification. So this is a, a classical postural fracture. So everyone can assess, uh, uh, notice that the uh, uh, postural fracture is there, but when the patient gives a complaint, uh, or history of progressive loss of sensation over the foot and particularly after an application of traction uh, while he was shifted from a primary center we uh, expect the neuropaxia is uh, developing and so emergently we did a ct we uh, we get the usual uh, section this is the classical postural fracture uh, when we opened this fracture we find that uh, the sciatic nerve was uh, being impinged by the fracture fragment and the intact fragment so uh, you can see the inflamed and uh, uh, the uh, fibers, this is edematous fibers of the sciatic nerve, which actually lead to the neuropraxia. So why it uh, occurs with the uh, traction? The capsule along with the fragment actually impedes the sciatic nerve, as you can see in the uh, picture. So uh, it was exactly like a knot cracker mechanism. So if you review the literature, there are uh, every paper, uh, uh, say that the dislocation and associated nerve injury are the two independent parameters which actually affect the prognosis of the fixation. And there are four parameters that is impaction, combination, and intraarticular fragment which actually uh, alter the prognosis, but these are uh, dependent on the expertise of the surgeon. So, so next uh, uh, we fixed uh, this patient and you can see uh, this is the four month follow up. There is some residual uh, falsy is there. So, coming to the next case, this is also a classical postural fracture with the dislocation. A young male, we failed to reduce in the uh, uh, emergency room. So, when we opened, we saw that uh, this is a torn pyriformis uh, from his attachment and which was obstructing the reduction uh, and uh, sitting the ball uh, into the uh, socket. So, uh, we fixed in this fashion. So why the reduction is important? Because uh, whenever we reduce the head within the six hour, the AVN chances decreases to 4%. But when it is uh, uh, more than six hour, it is up to the 58%. So uh, this is an example with the postural post column fracture. It was fixed after three days, but the reduction uh, dislocation was not reduced. So we can see the impaction and, uh, it is, and the dislocation. We can see the empty acetabulum. So this was fixed in this way, and this is the three month uh, post-op. And recently he has sent me with the WhatsApp and you can see how nicely the acetabulum is still congruent, but uh, the head has collapsed and the, probably the AVN has started. So even with a good reduction, AVN can occur and need to be discussed with the patient and preoperatively and to be documented to avoid the complication. So reduction of the dislocation is an emergency, not the fixation. Early fixation does not mean it is to be operated in the middle of the night, but we cannot afford a progressive nerve palsy whole night. Then why should I operate or when should I operate? If we, if we see this kind of x-ray, we can notice that it is a very uh, 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 almost anatomical hip, except the LC injury. So the trick, uh, the main complaint of this patient that he's unable to do uh, active SLR both sides. So this is actually a eyebrow razor. So we uh, did a CT scan. We can saw small fragment in the posterior wall. So uh, we uh, in the axial cord, we can see it is hardly about 10 to uh, or uh, 15 to 20%. That is the classical uh, uh, measurement given by the Keith Mayo. And uh, 
according to him less than 20% is stable and more than 50% is unstable instead of that we decided to uh, do a, a dynamic test uh, you can see both the uh, test uh, uh, physical uh, physically and on the floor dynamic you can see how the heap is uh, 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 unstable so what makes this unstable with this small peripheral fracture so if you look at the retracer it is not the uh, outer exit point it is the intraarticular exit point of the uh, fracture which makes the hip unstable and another is the percent of femoral head coverage and any history of dislocation make the hip unstable so this was fixed in this way and now he is almost 3 year follow up uh, 2 year follow up and so moving to the next uh, uh, x ray if we uh, see this x ray it is quite normal x ray except there is a increase in the medial joint space his complaint is there was a dislocation, it has been reduced, but now the heap is painful. So definitely some intraarticular uh, fragment may be there. So uh, this is actually a borrowed X-ray from my friend. You can see uh, this uh, fragment is below the uh, weight bearing area, and but there is an intraarticular fragment. So we have decided to fix with the suture anchor because uh, no plate was uh, put because the heap was stable enough. So uh, I will operate. Uh, any postural injury which is unstable. Unstable means whether it is a dislocatable or already dislocated. Uh, and in the stable fracture, I will operate only when there is any intraarticular fragment. So we can see the variety of range of postural fracture starting from the combination to the isolated postural fracture. But one thing is common, the displacement is toward the sciatic notch area uh, or the sciatic buttress area. So. Uh, so uh, this is a wonderful study. They have studied biomechanically the interfragmentary screw only. Then they have studied the interfragmentary screw with the non-locking plate and along with the interfragmentary screw with the locking plate. But unanimously, they, uh, they have concluded that uh, the uh, IF screw with the non-locking plate is the uh, statistically significant uh, 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 with the stability. Uh, so the preferred method of fixation is the IF screw with the buttress plate. But when they compared with the locking and non-locking, there is not much of statistical significance. So what is actually buttress? It is an effect or a mode of fixation. If you look at the tallest tower of the world, that is Burj Khalifa, it is also made up of with the concept of the buttressing. It is actually to resist the sure wall. In the classical teaching of the AO, if we, if we look at this, the buttress plate actually fix the apex. The first screw is given at the top of the apex so that there will not be any secondary loss of reduction. So if we put this plate towards the apex of the uh, fracture, it is quite medial. But you can see, though it is protecting the apex, it is not protecting the anteroposterior direction. It is quite, uh, uh, it is movable in all direction because hip joint is a 360 degree joint unlike this, uh, a knee joint or a distal uh, radius joint. So oh, IF screw, because when we put an IF screw, it is too medial or too superior. So as, as we move more medial or more superior, the cortex of this uh, uh, fragment decreases. So there is a chance. You can see the triangular fashion of this uh, fragment. So when we put IF screw, uh, it actually uh, when in the periphery part, it actually exerts some pressure and there is a chance of secondary fracture line uh, being created. So this should be the uh, ideal method of under countering and the last part of the tightening of the screw to be uh, tightened in this way so that the buttressing effect will uh, remain. If we if we'll, uh, over counter it and the plate touches the cortex, then there will be no buttressing effect. So you can see clearly this plate is somehow uh, out of the cortex with uh, 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 tightly holding this uh, fracture. So, oh, sorry. So, uh, again, it is uh, comminuted. So, buttress plate with IF screw is not an option here. So, there are other options like spring plate and Alice plate. So, uh, these are the spring plate which actually uh, hold the fragment uh, in place. And this is again a peripheral uh, comminuted postural fractures with posterior column. Uh, I was as an assistant surgeon with Professor Sipidas, and uh, this is his X-ray. Uh, again, uh, this is a uh, badly comminuted fracture, so it is impossible to put uh, interfragmentary screw to each fragment. So there is a concept that is two parallel plate recon uh, two parallel reconstruction plating. So as we do in the long bone, that is bridge place concept. 
Better to feel the fracture, not to see. Try to keep the periosteum and capsule intact and maintenance of the reduction with bridging plate construct as you doing mepoplating. So uh, I did it with a two plate construct. Just uh, open it, put a traction and reduce it. Feel with it, felt with the hand, and this is a six month follow up by the WhatsApp only. So you can see the joint is uh, maintained and he is able to work now. This is another case where you can see. Uh, lot of communication with the big fragment over the posterior superior area where actually i put uh, again there is a some head fracture is also there i explained the prognosis and i put one uh, buttress plate in the posterior superior aspect and put a plate in the peripheral part ideally the plate should be uh, put maximum uh, peripheral part but uh, once you put it periphery there will be difficult in putting the proximal screw sometimes it goes into the soft tissue also so the ideal placement is 5 to 6 mm medial to the lateral margin so this is his follow up recent follow up so again uh, reconstruction versus re replacement in the late presentation so uh, this is partly been covered by the chitta sir but uh, when we have two options, one is young male, another is the 56 year male. So these are the two variety of person we have to decide reconstruction versus the replacement. So this is a landmark paper by the Joel Mata that is he has uh, concluded that simple anterior or posterior wall fracture associated with the transverse po plus posterior wall fracture and t shaped fracture have increased risk of failure when treated within this time period. Another landmark paper by the Professor Sen and Hattel, uh, along with Dr. Sujit Tripathi, who is also uh, here, uh, it, with the 18 gauge needle, with the one minute aspiration by a 50 ml syringe, if the aspirate volume is less than one cc, then it is a predictor of the avian in future. So, uh, this is a two month old postural fracture came to me. Uh, with this, you can see already there is an arthritic changes, and uh, you can see nicely this pulsatile bleeding. So with this much of bleeding, how can someone go for a uh, arthroplasty? So, so I decided to uh, uh, osteosynthesize it. So I uh, put, uh, you can see the marginal impaction. Uh, then I have elevated it with a bone graft and you can see uh, uh, how the impaction has been elevated. So this is a this is the uh, typical construct with a uh, interfragmentary screw with the recon plate. But when I tested the joint stability, there you can see there is a widening of the medial joint space uh, to the uh, medial border of the femur. So again, I have to revise it. Sorry, again I have to uh, revise it. I put one buttress plate and uh, uh, in the super uh, posterior superior aspect to neutralize the deforming fo uh, forces because it was a old injury the there was tight uh, muscle and capsules uh, why it actually uh, uh, give away because when we put the periphery you can see the fan fracture line uh, throughout the cortex uh, throughout the interfragmentary screw which actually lead to the secondary loss of reduction so uh, this is uh, because after two months, the bone becomes almost uh, brittle and osteoporotic like the saw bone. So this is again an 18-year male. It was not bleeding from the head, but you can see, I uh, you can see how it is maintained up to the 32 months. The joint space is nicely maintained. So this is another case, 57-year male. Here straight away we went for uh, replacement. So now coming to the one important aspect of the postural fracture, that is the marginal impaction. Uh, marginal impaction is most commonly with the isolated postural injury, but uh, it, it can be also in comminuted uh, fracture. Why it is important? Because uh, the AO classification keeps it in A13, whereas a combination fracture, it is A12. Up to 46% of, uh, percent of the acetabular fracture can be associated with the marginal impaction. And they have correctly say, uh, said, this uh, American Journal of Radiology, they have said, uh, we believe that radiologist recognition of the marginal impaction is very important because not all orthopedic surgeons are familiar with this type of fracture. So actually, uh, it is to guide for the fixation. Uh, so which cross-section is important to look at the marginal impaction? So ideally, when you see a selected cords, we can miss the marginal impaction. So it is better to see the continuous video of cross-section in the console to be seen and to localize the pattern of the impaction. Uh, this is the best uh, axial cord or the best to visualize the marginal impaction. You can see I have used the femur head as a template. I elevated this fracture and uh, uh, 
and you can use the end on view to uh, to look uh, to put your sub control screw to hold the elevated part so this is uh, after the seven month and sometimes the fractures uh, are comminuted uh, and crumpled you cannot put a screw here so there is a technique uh, you can miss a wire technique or forgotten kr technique that you have to uh, leave that kr in, in situ after fixing this elevated fragment so uh next coming to the flip osteotomy when and why that is when we uh, uh when the fracture extend more anterior to this gluteal ridge then uh, the classical cockle ligament across does not give access to that area so, but and whenever there is a um, proximal fracture uh, the cockle ligament does not give access so uh nowadays most of the people are using modified gibson approach also but whenever this is proximal involvement is there it is always associated with anterior fractures so uh, this is one indication uh, for flip osteotomy for the uh, uh, isolated postural fracture is the delayed case as i have shown earlier so how to do this uh, flip osteotomy you have to keep some intact uh, trochanteric uh, and uh, abductor muscle so that you will not injure this uh, dominant vessels to the head so this is one example uh, this is uh, done by the flip osteotomy uh, then coming to the ho prophylaxis this most of the studies says that the indomethacin versus the radiotherapy prophylaxis against ho uh, has no statistical significance again there is a controversy between the 25 uh, mg tid or 75 mg od uh, there is no statistical significance another important thing whether the pre op radiation helps or not it is also not statistically significant but uh, ho prophylaxis you have to give whether it is 25 or uh, 75 uh, or in terms of radiation whenever you plan for a radiation it is better to give within the four days of the surgery so once the ho established it completes within three week after three week ho is very rarely seen uh, this is some of the example my failure cases what went wrong it is classically a transverse with postural fractures you can see Uh, how this uh, transverse part is incomplete and it is gone towards uh, anterior uh, column uh, sorry so, so you can see this is how fixed but you can see this anterior column has little bit elevated you can see in the right picture with the farabo clamp this fracture is completely reduced but but this is the difference when you look from the top you can see it is it is uh, uh, well fixed but when you look from the side it is opened up this is exactly what happened with these fractures so you have to contour this uh, plate for the posterior column so i made a mistake while i putting the uh, column plate i put it straight so i thought it is well reduced but uh, it actually opened up so you have to over contour the column plate and under contour the wall plate so he is a chronic smoker again uh, again he went for the non union and one another thing happened this uh, uh, probably i injured these vessels which lead to uh, o oh, avian of this uh, uh, superior part of the head uh, you can clearly see the gas of blooding is uh, blood is coming uh, so probably i have injured this uh, vessels just below the piriformis so uh, within few days it uh, became uh, arthritic and we have to replace it so then another x ray it is fixed and after 8 month i can see the result what went wrong for this case i am still now searching so to summarize uh, 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 progressive nerve injury is an emergency early reduction of the dislocation is important than fixation examination under anesthesia guides for defining instability comminuted postural fracture should be fixed judiciously preserving the vascularity and periosteum 3d printing is sometimes misleading you have to uh, read all the cuts uh, in the console additional plate to be considered when Uh, there is necessary under contouring of the wall plate and over contouring of the column plate is required to hold the fixation young uh, patient i always prefer osteosynthesis because there is a time frame of 5 to 7 year to uh, to be a frank uh, arthritic impaction injury to be identified and to be given time flip osteotomy uh, is required for the superior and anterior extension and sometimes in delayed cases ho prophylaxis to be considered 
frequent lavas and intermittent release of the gluteal retractor to be considered they have they have shown that the if the retractor is kept for the 3 minute continuously 3 minute and uh, there is and again the gluteus minimus muscle is the responsible for this uh, ho so uh, to conclude failure are not uh, discouraging rather inspirational for the introspection and for future improvement so with this i conclude uh, i'm stopping sharing so uh, so any question so the question is very very excellent so little lead singer so very well presented thank you thank you lot of cases very nice uh, so, so uh, we, we move to the next part uh, of uh, 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 backup yes sir my my presentation yes sir uh, this is pha probably your talk is last then we have case presentation or oh. is it visible yes sir it is visible okay so i'll be talking about whatever is the complication whatever happens after these acetabulum fractures If whether our fixations go bad or our uh, complications happen due to otherwise, or we have not been able to do anything, then we end up in an arthroplasty. The question is how often it happens. This is a sum up of about eighteen hundred thirty studies. Out of them, ten uh, studies had four hundred forty eight patients. And if you look at it, the problems are there of heterotopic ossification, more implant loosening, more infection. survival rate is not as 100% revision rate is relatively higher so any replacement after uh, acetabulum fracture is likely to be compounded with more complications the reasons could be that the anatomy is distorted the bone defects are there the femur had been subluxated fragments and then there could be a issue of adhesions there of previous surgery that's very important then there could be implants inside which are likely to alter our access the femur had may be totally lost the femur uh, had subluxated or dislocated or infection can be there that's all very very important to be seen overall because it is a second surgery in most of these cases or even wherever it is neglected it is more complex a surgery so we must anticipate more blood loss more than routine so we have to be ready for intraoperative salvage also if possible more blood should be available then surgical exposure will have to be defined because there could be hardware to be removed there could be heterotopic ossification and then we have to be ready for because some of these uh, the implants need to be removed sometimes some cannot be removed we might have to cut them out so metal cutter and all those things should be available in kind of a situation where we might have to take out these implants which are badly fixed and as happen after any case with the previous surgery there is always a chance of some kind of inherent infection over there so we must watch this patient for the csr crp and in any doubt this surgery must be staged from this uh, first surgery of removal of the implant and second surgery should be reconstruction that is the basis we must remember then coming to the technicalities also now we know that this acetabulum might be displaced worse than we have not done anything previously so there will be a uh, difficulty in identifying the exact version the exact inclination even after the surgery or after the injury the soft tissue balancing will be altered because of the altered bone so muscle adhesions could be there contractures could be there or hip might have gone medially or significantly or superiorly so limb neck discrepancy and offset problems are likely to be there now how do we look at these cases we look at these cases the cases which may not require any special reconstruction because they have been previously operated upon or they have very minimal of the displacement then we will see cases 
which require some extra grafting or some build up and then there will be cases where there is a significant alteration in the anatomy of these cases so first we look at the cases where we don't need any special reconstruction like this case yes it is a 6 years old dislocation the the sesta bonum is not normal you can see it out but there is a reasonable amount of a bone you just have to get an excess remit well and put an implant and you can see the outcome is quite okay another case again a 12 years old fracture dislocation yes there is a column displacement there is a wall displacement again you don't have to reconstruct except for a good amount of a reaming you have to do for the placement of the cup over there and if it has been done appropriately you can say the outcome stays good the assessment scores are quite okay for this situation now there could be a case where the previous surgery the some implants are left and there is a complication of the lysis of the femur head and now you, we need to remove these implants so it is again no much of the reconstruction required you just get in remove the implants can put up a cup and this is his four years follow up now this is another case where the surgery has been done the hip was okay now it has gone got a post traumatic arthritis and this needs a standard kind of a teacher no implant is likely to come within your way so it's a kind of a standard implant and your outcomes are again good in this kind of a situation this is another case where there is a comminution it has been stabilized with the the plates and this thing and you see the avian has happened into this case and you go for a, a reconstruction again that is not a bigger issue and it can be done and this is 8 years follow up of that case now now we look at the cases where something needed to be done like this case now there is a non union of the column obviously no uh, implant will stay in a non united situation so we will have to stabilize it's very difficult to pull it back to its normal position what do we do in a non union is in situ we put a plate to stabilize it and if we have stabilized it now the cup can be placed inside it and the uh, outcome is likely to be okay so the extra effort which has to be done is that you just like an esthetic surgeon you have to cut come over to stabilization of this implant another case with the same kind of a displaced and a non union you have to stabilize this posterior column and you can see it, it is done in situ you don't try to reduce it up because such a uh, old fracture it will be very difficult to get it back the column to be back so you just stabilize it and put a cup into that very situation and this is a 6 years follow up of that case you can see the posterior column still stays as displaced area now we look at cases which have got a significant alteration where you need to put some bigger graft some cage some mesh some impaction like this case now this is a significant dislocation which has persisted for 4 months and at this stage with the kind of the weight bearing dome and the femur head which you can see now there is no role of a primary reconstruction so a primary reduction so we just go for getting this head to be used in the posterior side as a wall and put a plate over that and then do put a cup and this is his three year follow up another case of the similar situation where you can see in the ct scan the kind of a loss on the back side of it so what we need to do we need to use this head to buttress on the posterior superior side put a plate to hold that graft over there and then to put a cup so that he can stand comfortably on either side another case of the similar nature again a posterior fracture so this is a very standard technique in which the femur head is used as a graft as for posterior wall and a standard posterior wall reconstruction is done as this now as professor romas was also saying that in these situations sometime you need to have special kind of a cup in which the host bone should be reasonably good to give good incorporation many time the contact area may not be very viable the host bone may not be very good so you need to use those relatively highly porous cups for that kind of a fixation the problem can be like this is a 19 years young boy where you do not want to do otherwise a replacement but then patient can sit squat but he is not happy the way he is walking around and he is wanted that we should be able to do something because his limp and this lurch is not likely to settle down and that is the reason so we went on to him and you see the head was very bad when we took it out still we freshened it up put it up as a posterior wall we did not try to bring this collar 
posterior column back to its position. So it was just build up like this place. So we build up this place, put up the cup into this side of a situation. And this is the placement we have done. This is the area. This is the cup placement after the head is placed and fixed with the kind of a cup. And this is his outcome at two years follow up. You can see the displacement still says, but rest of the cup has become reasonably okay. And he's happy now that he can walk comfortably in this kind of a situation. So that is the outcome which he wanted and it is possible with this displacement. Again, now this is a situation when there is a lot of bone formation, lot of, it was a 33 years old dislocation. He has been walking around like that only, but he wanted the sub kind of a reconstruction. The bone was very, very soft. We could not have a uncemented cup fixing after whatever the reconstruction we did. So we put a cemented cup into this area. He's still quite happy to be walking around subsequently with this kind of a fixation. Another case where this is a very old case when we used to have this octopus cage with us. At that time, because of the superior dome was also affected and dome cannot be uh, reconstructed with the graft. You need a kind of a uh, either an augment or a kind of a cage. So at that time, augments were not available. So we used an octopus cage and you can see how beautifully the octopus cage has been incorporated in the total setup. Now we look for the cases which has got a medial displacement, meaning by basically as when we say an estabulum, the entire column displacement as a part of ABC displacement, which has been neglected. Now this was a six month old injury. So you cannot get that kind of an extraction with this kind of a, so we just went put a lot of graft inside, put a mesh to hold that graft, and then we were able to do this cemented cup replacement here. This is another case, again, a five months old injury. Again, we did the same thing because the head was reasonably bad, five months old injury. So we just put up a kind of a lot of graft into this area and put a mesh to put a cemented cup into this situation. Another case which you can see of the similar kind of a nature where the head is also lysis, the bone is also bad. So in this case, because there was not much of the support, so we used a cage into this area. Again, this is one of those three-year-old estabulum fracture with a lot of comminution, with a lot of displacement of the fragments around. And again, in this case, we had to do a lot of grafting after reconstruction of this area. A lot of graft was impacted into this area. And from this situation, we could make it like a, this situation by using a mesh, putting up a lot of graft. And again, this is again, furthermore graft. So this is that kind of a fixation so that we could get, this is one month old picture where this was the, uh, this you can see the mesh, you can see the kind of a cup placement we can do. And then there will be cases where the center of hip is affected. Now you can see this is a 16 years old injury where the total pelvis, the hemipelvis has also been displaced like this. So here you, it's very difficult when everything is altered, but still you try to do, put a cup placement in a way so that you can get a place and you can put a cup over there and person is definitely much more benefited. Even still, there is an inclination difference still remains in the area. Another case of the same kind, this is 28 years old fracture dislocation, same kind of a situation. Now to get down to this place was very difficult. The bone here was also becoming less to so be put up in that very place. He is better as far as the length is concerned from that place, but we accepted the kind of a displacement here and he became better. Another case where there was a complete fracture of the ilium and when he came as a neglected area. So we went by that extensile iliofemoral EIF approach, what Dr. C.P. Das has beautifully told, and we stabilized this case and then we did a THR in the same approach and this is what his ability is. Now there will be some cases where there will be a discontinuity, a kind of a non-union, which actually will require some kind of a cup cage reconstruction like this case. Here you can say this was a, a, a kind of a situation, patient had come with an infection, we did debrima, cleaning, waited for two, three months and thereafter we used a, a reconstruction, a lot of graft and a cage along with it with a lot of graft and we could replace it and reconstruct like this. This is one of the very early cases done about 15 years back when this was a case, few months old injury and this was the situation. And when we uh, saw this thing and when we opened it up, there was actually no abductor mechanism also. So we did it in two stages actually. At that time, we were not very well versed with it. In the first stage, I put a lot of graft, at least six femur head I put inside it. And on this side, I used a Austin Moore 
once austin moore was able to settle and make a pseudo kind of an stabulum then i replace it with the cemented cup in uh, cemented stem and cup into this area and this is the eventual fall off of that case this is another case of a discontinuity which started as a simple estabulum fracture which did, which was not fixed well and it went into a non union again replacement was done which was not probably very appropriately done it went into loosening and eventually a frank discontinuity developed between these uh, these things so what was required is again the same kind of a octopus cage so i but for octopus as we needed to remove the previous implant applied the fresh implant stabilize the discontinuity put up a lot of a graft and then use this cage and over this cage it was a uncemented cup over there and this is subsequently the outcome of that patient after some time then there could be complication in this kind of arthroplasty because of the underlying bone and reconstruction is not appropriate it may just come out and give dislocation as a complication and if this happens again because the superior uh, area is also affected so we, we had to put bone we had to uh, protect it with the cage to get him moving again this is another such case which had the estabulum fracture it was fixed like this which went into a complication then some dhr was done and again this cup came out because the underlying bone was not very good for the incorporation of the cup and for that a kind of a uh, this we use this kind of an augment over here on the superior side with that augment we could stabilize this cup down there to give him abilities to walk around another case complication which can be happen this was probably a pelvic injury and a hip dislocation where this thing was done but it has come out and you can see the cup was also not very well inside this thing area so in this case we just went in use a muller's ring after adequate amount of a grafting and then this is the subsequent outcome two years follow up of this case there is another case where there was a repeated failure this was the case this uh, this is a carbol uh, cage which was there which was failed uh, this, this another cage also failed and then subsequently what when we removed this cage we finally settled with this tendered cup only because we had a good amount of the bone it has been grafted a lot in the previous surgery so we could get our primary cup well fixed now i have got about now it was 8 years but now i have got about 10 years follow up of this case this is my old case where i did a reconstruction before i was using my plate so i played plate i played one u plate a buttress plate this plate it looked to be okay on the day one but within some weeks it collapsed over there and i had to do a replacement so that was the reason as uh, professor romal also told this rate of conversion is 23.1% as far as this literature says and this was the same finding with professor romal also but there are cases now just like in this case in a 68 years man when the estabulum is also broken and the head is also broken we don't have much of the choice we immediately rather than reconstruction we went for the posterior reconstruction and did a replacement in one go another case significant posterior displacement in a 72 years old lady we did not try to do reconstruction we just put a cage after that cage we just stabilize it and put the lady to a sitting position post operatively with the kind of a fixation now this is an option that when is the need which was a question in the first lecture also when do we decide that we rather than doing a fixation we do a replacement now this was one case where you can see the bones were extremely osteoporotic comminution femur head was bad so in that case i just went with the iliofemoral approach reconstructed inside and then went outside with the posterior approach and did a replacement in the same go another case here there was a lot of comminution he was elderly again the same situation so i went inside it put a plate to stabilize and then i put a cemented even my cement had gone this side also but this patient was mobilized another case you can see the same situation where this was there he was about 3 uh, weeks old injury so i gave him a option and told him he says no i want a replacement right now so at that stage i just found that he, the inside this was relatively sticky so i just put this thing and subsequently the patient could be mobilized on this kind of a situation so we have published our findings in various times about these cases overall in last 10 years i had an experience of about 210 cases of uh, replacements in these estabulum cases this is the kind of the uh, we had a reasonable number of 
neglected acetabulum fracture with us, which is not there probably actually in the world, but we do have a lot of these neglected cases. 8% were my acute cases, while rest others were after a proper distinct surgery. So when we were right now assessing during the COVID time, we were calling to every patient uh, how they are doing. And this is a, we could link with 106 of all these total 209 where addresses were available. 106 replied and out of them, if we look at it, this is their best health. They can imagine 58 were quite happy. 25 further were reasonably well. So that makes to be reasonably good a percentage out of 106 cases. There were one was very bad. There were three cases which were okay at the 70 point of view. So if we look at their activities also, their anxiety, depression, pain, discomfort, usual activities and self-care activities. So we were not disheartened by the kind of the situation at this stage, which is a variable follow-up of a few years from few months to few years. So probably there is a role for this kind of a situation, but we have to understand this kind of a surgery will need good planning, a careful execution, and usually good results we take to get it out. And when we have got these surgeries, we have to be very careful about looking at all the perspectives of these cases. Thank you. Uh, is there, is there any questions uh, or uh, there, there is, is a case? case. So, so before the case, case, any questions? Uh, Sujit sir, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. So, so any question or straight away? Satya sir, you can share your... Uh, Yes, yes. Kishore? Yes, sir. Uh, should I start or? Uh... You can start, sir. Okay. You can start. Share your screen, sir. Dr. Prasad, are you there? Yes. Because uh, it is a yeah, uh, uh, Good yes. evening. Uh, am I audible? Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Are yes. uh, full screen, sir? Yes, sir. So I'm presenting. Uh, in fact, I'm sharing a case. Uh, after all these uh, surgical cases, uh, surgical cases, I'm just sharing a case which have not uh, treated properly or uh, not managed, I just managed this case. It's a case in the year yeah, uh, 2018 October, I received a male child, 13 year male child with RTA and she, he had uh, anterior wall fracture with PV cranial fracture and he has associated supracranial fracture numerous and he had urethral injury for which he had the suprapubic uh, uh, catheterization done already. The patient uh, was uh, highly, there is a, there is a highly jaundice there, the LFT is totally derangled, the lipocytes counts are very high. Then, then this is the X-ray. The anterior wall was fractured and the pubic uh, ramai was fractured also. And he has associated, associated, uh, it's a supraclinical fracture of humerus. Then this was the CT at the beginning. It is a 26th August 2018. This is a CT. The wall is open. And before, like the patient was not stable, not at all. The anesthetics uh, didn't give any clearance for the surgery. And for three weeks, I just followed. Again, the uh, leukocyte points were counter high. The patient was sick. And the jaundice part is not stable also. The bilirubin is still high. Then I followed. Then, in fact, after four weeks, I again the, uh, did an x-ray. Then I saw this, this. This was the picture. Then his father didn't agree for any surgical surgical treatment because of uh, Dick's involvement and all. I just fixed the supracondylar humerus before that with axillary block. Then, then I followed up this case. This is the four weeks. X-ray and this is a Judet view. Again, the anterior wall is open, and this is a CT on the four week. 
this all are four weeks the interval is still open and this is the eight weeks x ray the patient was gone home then he came back after eight weeks he has actually he has come from his urethral uh, urethral uh, uh, repair he has come for the urologist and i did the x ray and i found this uh, x ray at that, at that time and this was this was after five months again the the catheter was inside and he was uh, come for the urologist i followed the x ray and this is at the five months and this is what after one year five months the wall has started there is a signs of union and the wall has started little bit of modeling and this is after three years nearly almost three years last in the last month in july the wall is almost remodeled but thing is this gap the diastasis which was not earlier now he has a gap here but the patient and this is the city city of the recent city and the wall is somehow a little uh, there there's a wall here and but still is a gap diastasis pv diastasis is there and this is the city recent city and this is the clinical photo of that fellow it's now he is 16 after 3 years injury sitting comfortably this is a video probably it will walk this fellow is walking so my question is why is this diastasis has happened after 3 years dr prasad can you uh, light, uh, put some light on it to it why this uh, diastasis has happened which was not previously why this is diastasis was not previously can you show me the first earlier initial, x-ray uh, show the initial uh, pel- pelvic x-ray just want to see what injury is uh, there and the This is the recent X-ray. But what, what, the first one, very first. Pair. First one, I'll tell you. This is the first yes. cities. The first. I have, I have no idea. The, the symptoms look very good at that point. All you had is yes. the, the two fractures. <clears throat> the diastasis was not the the joint was intact. So there is a ramai fracture of the ramai is there and the anterior wall is blown out but up to the one one year follow up the diastasis was okay up to one year follow up so any input from other faculties as well sir uh, i just uh, i just up want to know months, regarding his five months that his, the, the diastasis his, was okay yeah but after one year it started separating the Then urologist now, have done some procedure no, it I'm was an done. spc no SPC. urologist the no, they, SPC, they have right? done spc uh, yeah and after yes. that did they do any urethral procedure for him or anything they have done they, they have, have done put? they have so done very likely, uh. very likely because till one year he was and having an spc till that time it looks okay and once mm-hmm. that spc has come out i don't know I can easily blame the urologist for <laughs> that because it looks as if they might have cut it from there, and, there and gone there. there. You, don't you don't know, know what exactly they would, they would have, have done for that, but it can possible. It is possible that they would have, if they have intervened from an anterior approach or through the some infection has happened, because if it had to be there, it should have been there in the first year. That's what I could gather from the X-rays and CT scan. So another thing is, what will be the future? What will be his future? It will be no, it should be problematic, or is it the and the pelvis? The stability is already there. The and and this stability does, does not the the end because we have got I'm not sure why why this the voice the voice is bad but but we have not many voice like this. 
this 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 profit will not not matter in the life of the children. 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 They will be in as well. As for as this, you will not be able to start. They remain on this category for years to come. That is that's the problem which stays over there. So it is as Dr. Vick also said is there is a urethral involvement. Must be some kind of a low grade infection which led to lysis of the bone. and that can happen in these bones also sometime they can be totally resorbed if they are not participating in the weight transmission across here that fragment was totally separated out not participating in the weight so it was a cancerous bone it got absorbed gradually and eventually it was lost anything which is bearing weight is always retained which is not bearing which is not participating can be resorbed especially if there is a low grade kind of involvement over there considering there was a long time of a cancer over there which we have seen uh, this kind of a situation not exactly the resorption of that level but we have seen this small absorption in these cases in number of these old neglected pelvic injuries because they are always having a cancer problem and which continues for years together till the urologist eventually defines the new areas uh, uh, new this things over them so these are known problem but as far as the gap is concerned i am little worried about one side uh, sacroiliac joint which seems to be totally fused mm, so yes, that yes. deformity is likely to persist but practically the pelvis yes the, but practically the pelvis is not likely to pose in a problem that there is a gap and tear they do well all of the life the biomechanics settles like that should you uh, should we do a serial x ray to evaluate this uh, diastasis Usually, they, I mean, we don't have to worry about because we have seen them for about ten years follow up, fifteen years follow up. Nothing happens to them. They grow like this. Also, they adapt. Uh, uh, yeah. They may not have uh, until unless <laughs> there are two things: rotational deformity and vertical displacement. If these two things are there, they will definitely have a problem. Now, recently, I have operated upon I think three patients now where there was a vertical displacement which manifested later on, and we had to correct their limb alignments for the length. Otherwise, uh, the end of frontal widening does not really matter much. If the patient had been a female patient, then should have a obstetrical problem. Right. I mean, it all depends on what yeah. are the issues. Obstetric problem can happen in uh, different ways. Many mm -hmm. times, I have removed some of the fragments, uh, this thing pointing into the vagina. So we have gone on the side of it. Taken them out and extracted them. I had taken out the fragment which was going into the this uterus, uh, this thing also, and some fragments going into the rectum also. So we do go from the sides and take these fragments out uh, on the call of given by the gynecologist or by those people. So we so, do that kind of things. So there is a question, sir, in my WhatsApp. So due to change in weight bearing kinematic and uh, and remodeling in a rotated pelvis, uh, mm -hmm. does it create new pelvis? No, it does not create a new pubis, but it settles on. As I said earlier, there is a lot of remodeling potential in this age group of the patients. Elderly or the matured bone may not behave that well, but this age between the formative years, there is a reasonable amount of remodeling in five, ten years of time. Sir, what had what would have been done if there were no uh, contraindication to surgeries? Uh, this, if there is no contraindication for surgery at at the early age. Yes, earlier. Yeah, uh, Doctor Prashad is there. Doctor yes. Prashad, what would have been the? Because now we see a lot of remodeling and uh, these things. So would have been in the first uh, choice that we have, would have intervened or not? Well, well, the piece looks pretty big. So I would have thought about it, but you showed me how stable the hip is. It's been very stable all along. So it's not essential to fix the piece, but I would have thought about fixing it because it's very big and uh, displayed. But that wouldn't have solved this problem. This has nothing to do with that uh, wall fracture. Basically, we must realize it is primarily a pelvic injury which has gone into the esternum rather than the esternal injury. Oh. This is primarily a pelvis fracture, not an esternal okay. fracture. Esternal it happens to be that the side of the pelvis, this fracture line went into the esternum and involved the hip, right? Yeah. So the primary stability and instability was of the pelvis as a ring. As a ring, right, sir. But so, that uh, sir, that one incision has been started to fuse. I think. Yes, yes, that is the reason. That's that the and, and that fusion is also is a good thing. That will make the pelvis stable, more stable. I mean, even the uh, that, that definitely helped in that way that it is a stable hip. But otherwise, also the pelvis has sacroiliac joint. If the problem what we have seen in neglected sacroiliac joint is 
that when you compare a neglected sac- uh, ilium fracture with a non union and a sacroiliac joint which is neglected the sacroiliac joints are usually paired because the ins- they don't have a fusion usually but if there is a fracture going into the joint then these fr- these cases might get this kind of a healing and they will fuse so because in this case probably if you had the cities of the earlier time through the sacroiliac joint we might be able to see why this joint went into fusion so another thing is if there will be if there will be any urethral diverticulum urinary bladder diverticulum will be there quite Sometimes, likely so quite likely so quite likely 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 you may get get in in the adult life i think yeah i mean the urologist will be able to tell it better because but they are likely to have these problems when it is a traumatic event so it is already sir, sir, sir. uh it, it is a, a excellent discussion so it is so we need to follow up this case so it is already 10 pm any questions to our faculties or uh, we should conclude any basan sir sujit sir yes so he is uh, um, uh, our uh, secretary odisha orthopedic association secretary so uh, now i am handing over this uh, platform to basan sir to conclude uh, his remark good evening to everybody it is a proud privilege and honor on my part to give vote of thanks as on the behalf of odisha orthopedic association to all eminent speakers for excellent and presentation and discussion i must thank professor president elect dr ramesh sen for beautiful presentation and in the last moment he so agreed for the uh, talk which was cancelled by our doctor cancelled by doctor rajpur rajpur yes. so thank you sir for accepting the i must i must thank professor romans paul romans for beautiful presentation in stable factor in old age actually it is a very controversial but he clearly mentioned clearly i thank other speaker dr vivek dr prasad Dr. C. P. Das, Dr. Kishore Panda, Dr. S. P. Naik for beautiful presentation. I thank our moderator, Dr. Pranav Sa and Tushar Panda for moderating the session. I thank panelists, Dr. Sujit Tripathi, Dr. Dinesh Kalle, and Dr. Vikram Kaur for active participation. Last but not least, I must thank Dr. Vishoy, Professor Vishoy Sahu and Kishore Panda for arranging the beautiful program. Thank you, everybody, for attending the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. ಎಕ್ಸಲೆಂಟ್ i mean one of those uh, you you hear in any international forum such wide experience we are very proud of him i mean he has groomed every pelvic surgeon in this country is groomed by him and uh, it's really heartening to see the type of work he is doing despite the covid time i know he is operating a lot of cases and it's, it's a real pleasure to be with uh, all of you this evening but i am very happy that uh, this is my home turf and uh, the boys are really capable dr sen please bless them <laughs> dr prashant uh, i hope you are in india and uh, or if you are in us i do not know where you are actually but uh, i missed your talk partly because of uh, the te- technical glitch in my talk and uh, i would like to go through your talk and if there is anything it is very interesting your uh, pediatric uh, pelvic cystic injuries and if there is anything then probably i'll send you a mail and uh, get a clarification but nice meeting all of you he so presented well satya has uh, i think in satya's case i think this was a saddle fracture and as dr sen this disuse thing probably went into you know the quite often you find this uh, fractures disappear when they are not used this was originally saddle injury but again what dr trika said cannot be ignored it's uh, maybe something somebody has cut this is again a very interesting case thank you everybody sir 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 dr dr sen please please sir we are in uh, we are having our annual conference of orthopedic association in month of january second saturday and sunday in okay. puri 
So okay. I am inviting you. You should be present there. Physically. Physically, yes, sir. Almighty. Ha ha. Pakka. Covid permit. Doctor, Zach, don't come in. If you come in, you will get you here. गुड नंबर ऑफ व्यूअर्स एक्चुअली इट इज एडवांस टॉपिक सो एंड अगेन दॉर्टरडे इज ए टाइटली पैक्ड फॉर ऑल अदर सब स्पेशलिटीज we had almost uh, how much uh, it is almost uh, 50 52 participants uh, and i think they are the uh, real estabular surgeons those who are listening uh, this uh, 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 discussions uh, yes thank you okay. thank, thank you all thank you all thank you all. Thank you. Well, um, good night good night good night sir good night sir good night sir thank you